Uh, hello uh, and welcome. Uh, hope everyone is doing uh, great today. Uh, I'm glad uh, to host and uh, introduce this workshop today. Uh, my name is Hatem Darwish and I am a researcher at uh, uh, Takeda Lab, Nagoya University. Uh, this workshop uh, is the result of uh, a fruitful collaboration between Nagoya University and the Augsburg University of Applied Sciences. Uh, also, uh, the international uh, collaboration within the Otuwer Open uh, Planner Working Group. Uh, the main theme uh, for our workshop today is the evaluation and assessment of autonomous driving software stack uh, con uh, concentrating on the scenario-based evaluation. We assume that everyone today is interested in autonomous driving applications and um, how developing a better uh, autonomous driving system is one step to save lives, increase efficiency, and generally improve our life in the near future. Um, and now let me introduce our uh, plenary uh, speakers. Uh, today, uh, we will start with the uh, professor and uh, vice president of Nagoya University, Professor uh, Kazoya Takeda. Uh, Please, uh, you can take the screen. Can I start this? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Can you hear me? Okay, great, 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 great. So um, thank you for introduction. And of course, it is my uh, great pleasure uh, to host uh, this workshop. As, uh, as Hatem mentioned, as an outcome of uh, continuous collaboration between the two research groups, I mean, the group um, headed by Professor Dr. Karlsten Margraf, thank you very much, uh, at the Augsburg University of Applied Science. And also uh, my group, my team uh, from Nava University. So, um, you know, um, obviously recent social deployment uh, of the cutting edge and um, intelligent vehicle technologies is very, fast and uh, that reflects the global demand uh, for the freedom of mobility, uh, which is based on the safe, affordable, and comfortable uh, technologies. So there are a lot of technologies and also technical challenges as well uh, to be addressed. Uh, and one of the most important challenges uh, in terms of social impact is assurance of the performance of technologies. So testing technologies on top of the service technologies are indispensable uh, for implementing intelligent vehicle technologies to society. So since the significant numbers of uh, subsystems uh, for the intelligent vehicle and mobility services are software systems, so the computer simulation is the most fundamental um, technologies for assurance. I believe that we still need um, 10 times more or even more researchers and engineers uh, to come and work together for the trustworthy and intelligent vehicle technologies and also implementing it into the uh, future mobility service um, in society. So computer simulation based system evaluation is a master skill, is a skill must for them, okay? must for all researchers and engineers in a intelligent vehicle field. So not only the basic skills uh, to run a car in a virtual traffic environment, but also designing and describing test scenarios. And maybe more importantly, evaluating the simulation results by projecting them on a real world should be fluently utilized by all of us. So this is a fundamental skill for the future researchers and engineers uh, who work for the real world and real application and also real maybe uh, business. So I hope this short workshop will be a good start point for students and also young engineers uh, who study theories, but not much familiar uh, with real world application. 
I, I believe that this uh, short course would be uh, something uh, help them. So I hope you will enjoy this uh, conference and also this workshop. By the way, um, we plan to record this workshop and make it available through our maybe YouTube channel uh, for the future study of students. Therefore, uh, please be aware of that uh, when you join in our discussions. If it is needed, uh, we can erase utterances of particular uh, audience uh, from the recording before uploading. So uh, please, I know, <clears throat> let us know about that. Uh, therefore, uh, please do not hesitate uh, to be a part of this uh, workshop, and I hope you will uh, enjoy uh, this workshop. Thank you very much for participation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Takeda, for your inspiring introduction. Uh, and uh, now, uh, with our uh, second plenary speaker, Professor Engineer of the Augsburg University of Applied Sciences, Professor uh, Karsten uh, Markgraf. Please go ahead. I have to switch on my, uh, my microphone. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Hatem. So, uh, dear Professor Takeda, dear participants of this workshop, um, yeah, as you already mentioned, autonomous driving continues to advance on its way to a mass product available to all the people that provides many benefits and the well-known chances to the human being beings. So, the implementation and the deployment of new mobility concepts offer the potential to improve the way of living in many ways. However, there are still a lot of challenges to overcome. So many players worldwide try to get on the market with different concepts and strategies for their automated vehicles while keeping them safe and reliable at the same time uh, to make them drive fluently through the traffic involving the other road users, vulnerable road users, include, including manually driven vehicles. So one major step in the development process is the transfer of the responsibility and accountability from the human being to the driving robot so that finally, the people can become passengers, and this seems to be the biggest hurdle by far to the ultimate goal. Um, in many approaches, more and more AI and neural networks are becoming part of the software with non-deterministic behavior now. Not only because of that, the question arises on how to judge and how to assess if a vehicle with such a high complexity is capable of mastering the challenges on the roads under var various environmental conditions without generating a non-reasonable risk for the public. Also, uh, it is a question uh, to which extent it would be reasonable to incorporate infrastructure into the overall system to facilitate the decision-making process, especially in complex urban areas. So I think the workshop today about scenario-based assessment for autonomous driving software systems is a great chance to contribute to the generation of answers to this particular question. So um, yeah, I would like to, to use this opportunity to express that I feel very proud and honored that we, um, the driverless mobility group from the University of Applied Sciences in Augsburg, Germany, are allowed to be part of this workshop together with, with you, with Nagoya University. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Takeda, for giving us this chance. Uh, we appreciate the, the cooperation with you very much. So that's actually what I wanted to say. 
now uh, in the beginning of this uh, workshop. So I wish everybody a successful workshop with a lot of new ideas and uh, productive discussions. And of course, a lot of, a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Kirsten. And uh, this is a really nice uh, introduction to our workshop. Um, and uh, without uh, further ado, uh, let's uh, start our uh, uh, workshop and presentations today. Um, uh, now uh, we'll, we'll start the uh, session two. And this session, we have two talks. Uh, first talk uh, is a general introduction, including the background about autonomous driving scenario-based testing, and it will be delivered by me. Uh, second talk will be about how can smart infra infrastructure contribute to the future of automated driving, and will be followed by uh, some interesting uh, introduction about uh, tutorial, sorry, uh, about using open scenario and uh, open drive uh, standards. And this will be delivered by uh, Matthias uh, from the Augsburg University of Applied Sciences. So allow me to share my screen. Uh, Can everyone? Uh, see my presentation? Yes. OK, great. Um, hello again. Uh, today's um, first presentation will be an introductory uh, about the topic. Uh, we can talk about this uh, for hours, but uh, I will try to shed the light on the important aspects on. Um, Today, I will give a background introduction followed by um, uh, introducing the scenario-based evaluation for uh, AD system. Then uh, I will discuss uh, scenario creation and how um, um, and why it is challenging task. Uh, then I, I will talk about uh, the evaluation steps, including the most common evaluation metrics available. Um, assuming everyone here know what is autonomous driving is and why do we need autonomous vehicles um, and uh, the levels of autonomy, uh, you all have seen these details before. So I will skip all that introduction uh, to save time. Then I will jump directly to the point. Uh, what, what is our objective? Uh, we are here today because we work on autonomous driving research and development and we want to deploy the technology to vehicles on public roads as soon as possible. Um, from the testing uh, point of view, uh, the autonomous driving development process looks like this. Uh, I know this can be divided into many more submodules, but I want here to concentrate on how testing is very important. Uh, we have uh, the like development stage as one step, but then it followed by several testing stages, such as functional tests, simulation tests, and a closed course test on a real vehicle, and then public road test. Uh, why we need all that testing and evaluation and assessment, uh, why it's important. Um, and however we call it testing or assessment or evaluation, it is important because we want to show, uh, we want to get acceptance from two important parties before deploying autonomous driving. First, we want acceptance from the society. We want to show them um, that uh, we have lower accident probability than human drivers. We want to prove that, um, um, that it works normally as a normal driver. Uh, also, uh, we want them to feel safe riding on this um, and, and feel that it acts normally and even better than the human driver. On the other hand, for legislators and uh, uh, lawmakers, 
we need to show them that we can uh, produce a concrete uh, validation uh, to our systems and uh, to prove by numbers, not only by, uh, by, by showing that it works, but also by, by other uh, metrics, uh, why this system works uh, and why we, we should allow, uh, allow it to run on the public road. Um, and also uh, because there is like, we wanna um, decide who's responsible and who's not responsible also, it's part of the acceptance uh, uh, process. Uh, but subset of, um, of that, how to, uh, how to approve, certify only the autonomous driving software stack. So there is a, it's a, it's a big system. So there is a hardware acceptance and software acceptance. We, we, con we will concentrate today on the software part. Uh, especially evaluating the planning and decision-making part of the autonomous driving software stack. Uh, how to show that the system is safe uh, or your software achieve uh, the ODD, uh, the intended uh, domain uh, you, are, you are trying to uh, target uh, requirements. So what are the methodologies to achieve that? There is several methodologies. First, uh, first one, drive as much as you can without an accident. Uh, second one, um, uh, show that the system is working fine inside your testing facility, or show that the system works fine in pure uh, simulation. Uh, and you can prove that using uh, hardware in the loop or software in the loop kind of simulations, or make logs uh, draw some graphs and present report full of evaluation results, like we do with the machine learning, uh, evaluating the machine learning or benchmarking the machine learning algorithms. Or using uh, well-designed scenarios um, that shows that the, the system deliver uh, normally as the, no like the normal scenarios we face every day. Or use formal equations um, derived from the application model itself to show, okay, this is a mathematical model that fits and, and uh, satisfy the, uh, the inputs that, and the hypothesis, we can satisfy the hypothesis, then that works. Or uh, we can uh, prove it as a functional based uh, from the ODD uh, functional requirements. Uh, once we satisfy the ODD requirements, then we say, okay, we have a working system or a valid system. So how big companies approach uh, safety assessment? Um, in other words, how the development evaluation process reflect on safety validation. For example, uh, Waymo, uh, as a huge company with a, with a lot of resources, they adopt the concept of racking up the mines. Uh, the development cycle looks like this, design, develop, deploy, then drive, 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 collect data, and then uh, design a solution uh, to handle the challenging situation when they, they found in the dr while driving, and then again develop and then continue driving more. Another uh, company like Tesla they do it differently. They already have a, a free massive fleet of cars driving around the, the world equipped with autonomous capable sensor suite. Um, the, the, approach of Tesla is to collect data and uh, scenarios and uh, find way, where is the challenging scenarios in the data or accident scenarios uh, from cars, uh, then build custom solutions that work with their own hardware and then deploy it back to the vehicles. Uh, Mobileye, which is uh, an Intel company, they took totally different approach that uh, with, they took the quantitative evaluation they have a concept called RSS, a responsibility uh, sensitive uh, safety, um, which is um, like modeling the the uh, um, uh, the human driving in in equations um, and just satisfy these equations. Um, uh, the dynamics they they embedded the dynamics and kinematics of the safety inside the RSS. So when you, when you uh, evaluate against the RSS, 
then you can satisfy um, envelope of uh, safety. Um, so even if we have the resources to rack up the miles or collect massive amount of data from huge fleet of vehicles, or even if we have uh, a good mathematical model, still we will face several challenges uh, of safety, um, such as uh, we need um, these items. Uh, in this graph, uh, I think most of you uh, have seen this before, um, which is uh, shows that the normal driving scenarios, situations, are all concentrated like uh, on the beginning uh, uh, here. So we have a lot, like when we drive, most of like 99% 90, of our driving situation are in the safe area. But then there is some average or challenging situations. Uh, but then there is the dangerous situations, which is re super rare to, to find in, in the data. Uh, so um, we need to design those uh, customly uh, from experience, uh, but it's um, dangerous if we want to test on a real car on a public, this is dangerous to, to do and it co will cost a lot and it's a slow process. And, and really for different countries, one other problem is uh, universally uh, different uh, driving behavior uh, generate different uh, challenging situations. So what it, what's it's challenging here in Japan might be might not be uh, um, a challenging in other countries and vice versa. So we need to cover uh, these um, these scenarios or these uh, situations to uh, be able to to have an uh, universally evaluated system. So. Uh, we need to decide what is the target of our testing. It's a huge um, task. So let's divide it into um, target by some, by, by some tests, uh, some modules of the uh, software um, uh, stack. For example, uh, for uh, machine learning, um, neural network based uh, perception or perception parts, uh, there is some tests we can verify and validate that this part works fine. For object tracking, the same. Uh, for integration, we have also integration tests. Uh, one of the most difficult part is the planning uh, with the global, local, and behavior planning, which in embed the decision-making process, which decide where to break and how to break and how to avoid and when to avoid and when to follow the rules of the and how to follow the rules of the of the road. Um, so and and to test that we need a lot of scenario based testing, and also different uh, ODDs of um, it's it, the ODD itself could be embedded in the planning process. Uh, so it's tightly coupled the the ODD and planning and the scenario based testing and plan. Uh, so I, I was talking about ODD and like the operation operation design domain a lot. So why it's good to talk about it? Uh, it is easier to evaluate an AD stack for a specific operation design domain rather for everything. Um, and safe uh, functionality must be ensured. The so-called safety of the intended functionality. Um, and for ODD, if no technical issue, the system functionality must not induce dangerous situation. If we avoid that, then we can accept that this ODD or this, this design works fine for this application. So uh, let's jump to the main point today, is, which is scenario-based evaluation. Um, in this workshop, we target the scenario-based testing for the autonomous driving software stack generally, and for planning, and decision-making uh, modules specifically. Scenario-based testing also suitable for ensuring the correctness of the target ODD. A scenario could be as simple as driving uh, from point A to point B or as complicated as uh, the figure uh, here. Um, the formal definition, one of the formal definitions, we can say there is a, a one formal definition of uh, what scenario is. 
um, could be a temporal, is it, which is a temporal sequence of seen elements with actions and events of the participating elements occurring within this sequence. Action and events in this respect mean, for example, maneuver like cutting and following a vehicle ahead. Um, in, in this uh, scenario or this scene, we have a bus parking and the bus, bus stop and ego vehicle wants to uh, decide whether to overtake the bus or follow the bus. And there is another vehicle coming on the other lane, which is a very common, although it's a challenging, but it's a very common situation we face it every day several times while driving around. Uh, so, so this is one example of how um, the, the, the scenario can, can be represented. And also this scenario could, be, be, could become much more complicated when we introduce a couple of cyclists uh, and several pedestrians uh, to, this, to this scenario. Um, we can categorize scenarios into three main categories, uh, functional uh, scenarios, uh, which is verbally defined uh, closer to human uh, language, um, which they are higher, uh, high, highly readable. Um, logical, uh, defined by parameter range and uh, distributions. Um, concrete, defined by uh, exact parameter and uh, parameter value. Um, also, the parameter, the parameter range or, or layers of a logical scenario, we, which, which we, we introduced here, um, could be, uh, we have mainly uh, five layers as defined in, 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 uh, in, in this uh, paper. Road level layer, uh, traffic infrastructure layer, tempor uh, temporary, uh, temporary, manipulation of L1 and L2. So uh, changing the road level uh, parameters, traffic infrastructure parameters together can make, uh, we, we can put it in one level and then objects, the road participants, the, the NPCs the, um, or other um, introduced objects in the, in the scene and also environments such as weather uh, environment, uh, if it's rainy, sunny or snowing and such. In this slide, uh, I tried to summarize the scenario-based uh, evaluation types. Um, at the top, we have the scenario design. Then we have the evaluation, two, two main types of evaluation for the scenario. Assume we, we were able to design a scenario such as the bus stop scenario. Uh, then how to evaluate the scenario we we'll think about two type of evaluation to accept the system, qualitative evaluation and quantitative evaluation. A qualitative evaluation uh, could be categorized also into success or fail of the system. Uh, is it human-like or comfortable or not? So this is kind of the acceptance for the society. Uh, it's working, it's uh, human-like, it's comfortable. Um, then we can achieve success or fail programmatically using simulation tests or uh, in uh, closed uh, circuit tests. Uh, in human life, we need public, public road tests and with uh, actual human writing and, and giving opinion about the system. Uh, in the quantitative uh, part, there is, uh, we, can, we can do it in two ways, two main uh, ways we will actually talk about those today. Uh, traffic in fragments, like how Carla simulator uh, does it, um, and safety envelope uh, um, comparison, like RSS, like mobile eye, how they do it. Uh, so, and, and then those, we can do it using simulation and data log replay. We can log data and, and replay it and compare it to the model and uh, make sure that it satisfies the model. Um, now, uh, after talking about the uh, introducing the scenario, uh, let's 
take one more step and see how to create uh, the scenario. And what are the methods and the standards of creating scenario for uh, the scenario-based scenario -based evaluation? Uh, in the section, we'll talk about the creation and the standards and give some examples uh, on the available tools for creating scenarios. Um, there, is, there will be more tools you, will, you can see uh, online uh, like for open source or even, even commercial so, uh, tools. We tried here to introduce the common tools we use in our um, uh, academic, uh, the daily academic in Nagoya University and in the Augsburg University of Applied Sciences. So uh, two main approaches to create scenarios. First, uh, the manual approach. Scenarios created by experts. Um, second is the automated approach by using AI or pre-designed uh, models. Uh, there are several ways to create the scenario manually. Uh, for example, uh, by writing code using uh, favorite uh, language, uh, could be Python uh, language, um, or could be C++. Uh, for Python, we will see some uh, example today, uh, how uh, Carla uh, uses Python uh, code to create scenarios. And also for C++, you could use you could use you could use the G test library uh, to create unit tests uh, scenarios uh, as a unit test for uh, separate modules. Uh, second, um, uh, by composing a set of tags, values, and certain structure in a configuration file such as .yaml file, .xml, or any custom config file. Uh, third, using some tools, uh, graphical or uh, text-based tools uh, that make scenario creation more natural and easier. Automating the scenario uh, creation process could be achieved by several techniques. First, uh, directly extract scenarios from driving data. Uh, second, by extracting scenarios uh, from well-documented uh, accident reports. And then finally, uh, by expanding existing scenario, concrete scenarios uh, using the parameter, their parameter uh, ranges. Depending on the scenario creation method, we can categorize the scenario uh, in two main categories. Exact scenarios, mostly used for deterministic uh, tests. It is good in the uh, development phase, such as, um, such as unit test and integration test. It is used as part of continuous integration CI process. Where, uh, when we want uh, the, the, the results to be repetitive and exact result come out of the scenario each time, uh, then, um, and it's well defined, then exact scenario can work um, perfect in this situation. Uh, but sometimes uh, it takes long time. If we want to cover much more scenarios, it, it will take um, a lot of time. Then we need to automate the process of, of testing, uh, of creating scenario and testing the scenario. And we need uh, uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of scenarios. Uh, so um, it, it could be a parameter-based uh, means uh, we have a concrete scenario and we have a distribution uh, defined for each parameter, which can work as uh, the, the range, the safety range for this parameter. Uh, for example, the, the velocity range of the ego vehicle or the position range in the lane and so on. We can, using that, these, these distribution, we can create uh, many, many different uh, scenarios. And also uh, we could extract directly from driving data. Um, each scene can include a lot, uh, hundreds, maybe five minutes scene of driving data can include hundreds of 
escenarios. Um, especially in scenarios uh, manual creation, we need a lot of experts to annotate the scene and create required scenarios. And these are, um, this is the main challenge. Other challenges is um, not only we need experts, we need a lot of experts and trained experts to, to define the scenarios, who understand the problem and who understand the, the objective of defining the scenario uh, for this, uh, for autonomous driving or for spe special uh, ODD. We need thousands of scenarios, as I said before, um, to, to be able to automate the test. Um, we need to extract these scenarios um, easily and, and fastly and actually evaluate these scenarios also. Um, in the opposite, actually, it's, a, it's a, another challenge is the ability to limit the generated scenarios. Sometimes we can, yes, we can generate scenarios and, and expand the parameters, but it could get out of hand. So we need to know which parameters and uh, what is the, the reasonable expansion and the uh, randomization or um, um, sampling is, is, is enough to cover our uh, uh, objectives. Um, so, and like picking the parameter also is a challenge. So each of these challenges uh, actually uh, uh, could be a research uh, point for, uh, for a student and uh, for a, research, uh, a researcher. Uh, they're all challenging and we, we actually uh, still uh, hot topics and we need more contributions in these areas. Either uh, it is a programming language like uh, Scenic uh, or well-established standard maintained by one of the most active standardization organization, uh, ASM, as, such as Open Scenario. It depends on the scenario uh, database you wish to, to use. Uh, so these are the standards, but I can say I, I, will, uh, I will start using one standard but the scenario database is defined with another standard. So first we just try to, uh, to check the standard. And if the scenarios database uh, pro provide multiple standards, that, that's great. Uh, and actually most of the databases now try to, to, to cover uh, one standard uh, of the common one, such as open scenario. Um, also, so I, I, I will talk more about Scenic and uh, Verify, um, and, uh, and also we'll talk more detail about the ASM Open Scenario Standard. Uh, common Road Standard is related to the Common Road Database and Common Road uh, Benchmarking. Uh, general YAML or XML, so any programmer will, uh, I, I wanna define scenarios, I wanna tags and values, then YAML and XML files are suitable for this task. Uh, that's why actually the open scenario is based on XML and uh, some other um, um, scenario definition like in T4 scenario uh, def uh, definition file, they use YAML to define uh, the, the scenario output from their scenario editor. Uh, because in, in our workshop today, we will uh, include tutorials uh, such as using Open Scenario. Uh, so I will just briefly um, introduce the ASM uh, Open Scenario. ASM is the, the standardization organization. Uh, one of their uh, standards they, they maintain is Open Scenario. They also maintain Open Drive and Open Label, which I will talk about later. Uh, but mainly we need to know that there is main, uh, two versions uh, supported now, may, uh, like widely supported, version one and version two. Version one is a continuation of the original open scenario definition uh, before ASM takes over. Uh, it is a low level and concrete specification format uh, designed to be read by simulation tools. Uh, version two is newly introduced, uh, which is a proposal for future development. 
uh, it's a high level abstraction for maneuver description and data set and uh, tests. Uh, according to ASAM, the roadmap, the, the both version will merge into one standard by the end of 2020. Um, for one of the uh, ways to create or the tools to create the scenarios is to use the language as we discussed uh, before. Uh, one of the languages is uh, developed here is the scenic, uh, which is a probabilistic programming language, defining um, distributions over scenes and scenarios. The use cases of scenic is uh, data generation, uh, test scenario creation, uh, verification, uh, debugging. Um, the map support uh, for uh, scenic. Uh, we all when we when we want to use a tool or or creating a scenario, it's it's tightly related to the map. So map format is very important uh, and. Supporting a standard that is widely used is also very, very important. Uh, Scenic, they support Open Drive, uh, which is uh, it's, uh, the basic format for a lot of uh, simulators. Uh, up with scenario format, they have their code file. It's a Python code file. Uh, and because they are using, um, I don't know exactly because they are using or they choose it because they want to target sim uh, simulators such as Carla and SVL. Uh, and actually, they, they also support other uh, different simulators. Uh, another tool we can create scenarios using, uh, which is a nice graphic, nice and simple graphical web based tool for testing scenarios for uh, that runs on scenario simulator version two. Uh, the use cases of this tool design and uh, to design to evaluate uh, AutoWare's functionality and evaluate certain a uh, autonomous driving ODD. Uh, the map format supports here is uh, one common standard also called Lanelet 2. Uh, the output scenario format is a custom YAML file and the supported simulators is a scenario a simulator version 2. Uh, now we will uh, talk about scenario uh, evaluation. Uh, it is very important to be able to evaluate the scenarios themselves, uh, find which will uh, best suit the AD evaluation objectives. So we want to pick the scenarios, to query the scenarios, uh, or which and know which one will maximize the uh, ODD evaluation metrics. This step comes after having uh, thousands of scenarios created and saved in uh, a DBMS. Uh, so we, we want to know how to store and, uh, and explore the scenarios before even we get to, we get to the evaluation stage. Um, so how to, uh, like, is there examples for a database management system for scenarios? Uh, the options we have uh, and we will see around in open um, open source data sets for scenarios, there's two main uh, options. One um, is to save scenario, scenario tags and taxonomy in database. And then the files will, the, the, act, the concrete files or the scenario files uh, will be saved on the cloud or on the uh, somewhere as, as uh, using file management system, uh, because it's a huge, or if we can actually expand and use um, a capable uh, DBMS, um, we can save both tags and scenarios data in the database. They both have advantages and disadvantages, but it depends on the application and the available resources, of course. So is there a standard way uh, to do this? Um, actually, recently, uh, ASAM, they, they introduced um, something called open label. 
Um, open label is a data definition standard format that establish the basic principle and methods for two things. One, annotating multi-sensor data streams. The second, tagging test scenarios, which is our concern today, uh, which, which will be used in the autonomous driving uh, development and testing. Uh, this new standard, um, the, the, the workflow looks like this, and actually um, most of us are, uh, it, it is very common in the testing of autonomous driving. Uh, first, capturing the data and data processing and labeling. Then data storage, this is the uh, data database. And then scenario tagging or scenario labeling. Um, and then scenario uh, database search, we can query uh, after saving uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of scenarios in our database. And then implement uh, implementation in simulation and test, evaluate the scenarios in simulation. Here, scenario labeling and tagging is totally different than the open scenario that defining where the car is. Uh, it's more high level way of categorizing and, uh, and organizing the scenarios than defining the actual scenario. As we will see later, defining the actual scenario, we will use open uh, scenario. Uh, uh, open label is like a, an upper layer that enable us to create the database for scenarios and to be able to query and to be able to do this, automate the process much uh, in, in a standard way. Um, so it's very useful in, in these are like what says it's facilitate, facilitate or, or, or um, enable us to do. Um, we can uh, in, in standard, uh, standardize the clustering of scenarios and facilitate scenario storage systems, uh, enable efficient search and filtering of test scenarios and data basis, we wanna target one function. So we, we need scenarios that satisfy one function. So we don't want all scenarios, we wanna query about that. Uh, facilitate, facilitate information sharing between scenarios, scenario databases. Uh, each uh, organization, they have different uh, data and, they, and, and we can say each country will have different types of, of kind of challenging scenarios and scenario data sets. So uh, by using open label, we can uh, share uh, these scenarios together and improve uh, maintainability and reuse of test scenarios, which is very important. And it's rarely, uh, rarely now we can reuse and uh, the, the scenarios in different, uh, with different research group can use other research group scenarios. Um, so uh, the same, um, Azam and uh, other other uh, organi organizers they they developed this uh, data set called Safety Pool. Um, it's a, a, a huge uh, scenario database. Uh, it's a, an initiative of board uh, automotive community members aimed to provide a way to uh, certify AV safety. So here, certify means scenario based certifying. The, sa the safety of autonomous driving software stack. The library contains 100,000, over 100,000 test scenarios. And the uh, scenarios, uh, scenario database contains diverse set of uh, curated scenarios. Uh, they are generated from multiple sources. As we said before, expert knowledge, accident databases, uh, and uh, naturalistic data. And they are ready to be visualized and test on Carla simulator out of the box, which is very important to have an option like uh, to, to satisfy a standard. If you, are, if you are working on a standard, it's easy to, um, um, for your work to, to be able to test it on the uh, common and the, the, the widely used uh, tools like Carla or SVL. So next, system evaluation using scenarios. Now we have a database full of scenarios and we want to evaluate the system against by running uh, these scenarios. Generally, we have two types of evaluation to be considered, microscopic and macroscopic. 
Uh, microscopic is when expert or system user experience the scenario and see the results or uh, visualization results, which could be subjective. Uh, so we have some concrete scenarios and we want to see test its, its success or failure, exact scenario to satisfy one functionality. So we are continuing on testing a specific situation or a specific set of functionality. Macroscopic uh, evaluation, which could be automated uh, or should be, actually it should be automated and embedded inside the continuous develop, uh, development and uh, integration process, the CI process of the development uh, of the autonomous driving software stack. Um, it, it used, we used it to, to, to do total system evaluation and system uh, verification. And the result is just a report, a statistical report of what uh, happened when we run all these scenarios uh, on the developed system. Today we will see some, uh, actually I, I just wanna uh, tell everyone, um, we will see some example of, of the microscopic scenarios, uh, tutorials, uh, how to use microscopic scenario tests and also how to use macroscopic scenario and how to use, how to integrate it as a continuous integration with uh, AutoWare, for example. Uh, another categorization to the evaluation process is manual evaluation and automated evaluation. They might be similar uh, and, and different in some ways. The manual evaluation uh, analyze and evaluate log file and visualize the visualization of images, uh, usually check uh, success or failure. The automated run one or multiple scenarios automatically as a part of automated testing CI. An evaluation model is used to calculate or summarize the report. So this is different. the difference between automated. We have here a model which uh, accumulate or aggregate all the results to give one report about the, the system, the running of these, of the list of uh, scenarios. Um, evaluation uh, model uh, examples here, these are some of the benchmarks uh, we can we can use. Um, we want to measure the testing results. We need uh, quantitative metrics to assess the system uh, validity. So some of these quantitative is success or failure. Was the test complete or not? It's on and off. Um, also, we can use the time to collision, the TTC uh, distance to the next vehicle. Um, or distance to the, but the collision vehicle uh, previous or, or next. Um, and, and we set threshold and we can, after calculation and setting some, some parameter threshold, we can say and evaluate how safe um, uh, the, the, the scenario is by, by these values. Uh, also, we can use exact rule violations, uh, evaluation system like lane departure, collision occurrence, ignore stop sign. We will see some example, Carla leaderboard evaluation metrics uses these uh, violations as, as the, the basic cost function. Uh, simply if, if our scenario drive in the center of the lane and, the, and the, the system drive slightly outside the lane, then it's a violation. But if the system drives inside the lane uh, like vibrating inside the lane, but never, um, uh, never violates the lane departure rule, then it will it will say it's a success. So also there is a, some limitation with this rule based violation. Uh, or we need to actually define much more complicated rules to 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 ensure the, that that our final um, that the metric our metrics it, uh, can satisfy the whole evaluation system or evaluate the whole system. Uh, also the mathematical model covering safety rule um, uh, 
like uh, close contact dangerous situation, general this dangerous situation or uncomfortable. Sometimes if we define the model more conservative, we can define uncomfortable situation when we are close, but it, it's not dangerous yet, but we are close to the dangerous zone. Example of that is uh, the responsibility sensitive safety RSS. And also the common road cost function works the same by mathematical model defined over the dynamics and kinematics of the system. Uh, to summarize, uh, in this diagram, the whole variance of the process is explained in details. So we have uh, scenario sources, different scenario sources, experience um, or the experience driver or from data, from driving data. Then we go to the uh, testing system, partially or fully uh, um, auto automated system, or it's a CI uh, for develop uh, uh, inside the development cycle. First stage is scenario generation. So we need to either manually generate it or have manually generated scenarios or uh, extract automatically from the data. Uh, then a scenario persistence standard format, as we discussed, we can have our custom format, language based, or uh, using some standards like open scenario, uh, common uh, or widely used standards. Then the next stage is evaluation or selection uh, of the uh, scenarios that satisfy our, our goal. Uh, testing, um, falsification uh, or model-based, th these are like techniques to select the proper scenario. Then we do scenario execution. We wanna run the scenario. So when we, when we run the scenario on the real car, this is one stage of the testing, on final stage of testing, or run it on simulation like Carla or SVL, or uh, run it uh, in uh, software in the loop uh, cycle to test some Function, debug some a deep functionality, we, we, there is a problem with something, or hardware in the loop before we go on the real uh, car using the real sensor, we need to uh, test hardware in the loop uh, on some, uh, some hard, we include some hardware equipments inside the, 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 the whole AD stack cycle. Uh, finally, we, after running the scenario, you wanna get result and evaluate the scenario uh, by uh, either macro microscopic, uh, qualitative or quantitative, or macroscopic, which we wanna a statistical results uh, saying how close, uh, how close this to uh, satisfy uh, the, our ODD uh, design for this uh, application. Uh, with this, I conclude uh, my uh, introductory presentation. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for, for listening. Um, maybe I will take some questions. Uh, if anyone has a question now before we go to the next presentation. Please uh, feel free if you want to send your question uh, in the chat, oh, uh, also possible. Uh, hello. Uh, hi. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. So during your uh, discussion, you mentioned um, some uh, safety uh, measures that can be uh, added to um, evaluating a uh, scenario. Uh, you mentioned the uh, time to collision, for example. Um, I believe perhaps uh, RSS is among the most accepted uh, uh, measures for um, uh, risk. So do you know any of these um, uh, standards that you have mentioned to the, today that follows uh, rules defining the RSS? Um, uh, sorry, 
again, what's that like <laughs> exact question? <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, here, for example, this. here, for example, that yeah. uh, you have mentioned the evaluation of models or so benchmarks. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, uh, for example, the time calculation as one measure of, uh, say, the success or mm -hmm. failure of the test. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, we can say that's a, a measure of the riskiness of mm -hmm. the of the test, correct? So um perhaps the intercalation is uh, is a bit uh, loose uh, there are many factors involved in safety so you what you have stated here for example in the very last part of oh, the that part is the rss method so any of the existing benchmarks public benchmarks or public methods or um, methods uh, that actually is using rss do you know um like like for 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 uh, approving the system you mean uh, yeah yes exactly that is actually deploying uh, rss in the uh, evaluation um, part. currently um, um, um only mobile i use this uh, because it's it's their own development uh, so mobile i uses the rss uh, actually not only in the uh, uh, in, in the in the uh, verification, but also RSS can could be used as a, a safety envelope layer. So at at this, an, like second stage, before sending signals to the vehicle to ensure additional safety in the like in actual driving. So they use it uh, to generate uh, uh, some uh, or to ensure that the that the driving is safe all the time. Uh, Another system uses the RSS, uh, also Apollo. Uh, it's an open source uh, software stack uh, developed by Baidu. Uh, also, they are uh, they used um, uh, RSS as part of uh, of their uh, as a safety layer because RSS could be used in evaluation, uh, offline evaluation, scenario based evaluation, or as a safety layer. So those are the two main uh, known uh, systems that they use RSS uh, from me. Um, mm. Also, you can use it in Carla. Uh, Carla uh, include RSS uh, inside the evaluation. Uh, I mentioned here the uh, exact rule violation they use for the leaderboard or the, their benchmark. Uh, but they have the also RSS one. Uh, in the couple uh, previous years, they have some limitation uh, like handling the, the intersection. But I think re recently they are they have been working on this and uh, maybe soon we will see them replace the this rule violation with RSS. All right, I understand. That's very good to hear. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any other question? Okay, um, I think I will um, conclude my um, talk now and uh, ask uh, uh, Matthias to uh, go ahead and start his uh, presentation, uh, please. Hi, hi, Hatem. Thanks, thanks for your, uh, thanks for your presentation. <laughs> Um, do you do you want to go with the? Uh, yeah, we can go with the, your presentation. Then we maybe take a break for uh, mm -hmm. uh, fifteen minutes and then do the tutorial. Okay. Um, just just give me a heads up if we want to go. Okay. For the noise issue. I know it's big. okay. Perfect. Um, I shall share my screen. Okay, um, can you see it? Okay. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Matthias Pehinger. I'll give you a, just starting up with my talk now. 
So how can smart infrastructure contribute to the future of automated driving? Um, to the agenda. Um, I'll start with a background of my research to cover the topic a little bit. And the main part will be a workshop about scenario select examples. So for my research, how I chose my scenarios and then how I generated open drive maps and how I generate open scenario files. A little bit um, hands-on after the great introduction of Fatim. Um, about me, um, they've got my PhD thesis title is Hard in a Loop Tests on Infrastructure-Based Guidance, Automated Vehicles in an Urban Environment. Um, the title is, the main question for me is, how can smart infrastructure contribute to the future of automated driving? And to answer this question, I'm working together with the University of Applied Sciences, which is my um, main post position right now. I'm working together with TU Munich, with the Chair of Traffic Engineering. Um, my research is sponsored by Siemens. I'm working together with the Bavarian scientific uh, research community, and of course, the Nagoya University. Um, the next thing about the system I'm using for my evaluation to answer my uh, research question. I'm using this setup over here. So I'm going just, this is just maybe a little bit overwhelming at first, but basically I'm using a microscopic simulation. I'm going to tell you a little bit more in the next slide of what the microscopic simulation is. A sub microscopic simulation and a hardware in the loop system. So what's the microscopic simulation? For microscopic simulation, um, I'm using AMSA Next. It's a microscopic traffic simulator. Um, you can simulate several traffic participants. So uh, like bikes, pedestrians, cars, trucks, you can simulate all of them and configure traffic demands for them for different roads, for huge road networks, for whole cities and all that stuff. And you can also include uh, traffic lights. So a lot of uh, options in here for microscopic traffic simulations are just some of the features I'm using. And um, this traffic, so I have um, some vehicles. Uh, at the end, I will show a video which, which summarizes everything and makes it a little bit clear. Uh, I have a lot of vehicles which are driving around in the simulation environment. And these are then sent to the, or communicated with the sub-microscopic simulation, which is, um, Using Simpson to pre-scanner software here, you could also use Carla for something like that as a source alternative. Um, this is a whole 3D environment for 3D simulation. So all the objects from the microscopic simulation are sent to pre-scanner, then are simulated in three-dimensional three 3D environment. Also inclusion, occlusion simulation, that stuff. Um, also in there, I have for my ego vehicle, a vehicle model simulation. So it's, it's basically the, the microscopic simulation. A lot of traffic researchers only use microscopic. I introduced the sub-microscopic to have more detail in the whole simulation system. And then as well, uh, we have to extend the simulation further on. Um, I add hardware in the loop. So what basically, what, what's hardware in the loop? Hardware in the loop can be at, at a lot of levels. Uh, let's just give you two examples. So. You could just go with a vehicle computer. So uh, we have the submicroscopic simulation, which um, creates commands like steering angle actuation, throttle or brake command. And then I use a computer, which is commonly used um, in a vehicle and send these commands to the computer where, for example, the automated driving software is running, let it evaluate it and send it back to the submicroscopic simulation. Or what you could also do is use the complete real vehicle and introduce a complete, just like use a parking lot or something like that, and introduce the complete vehicle into this into a virtual environment, but actually it's just driving in a parking lot. So different levels of part in the loop. But what I'm mainly focused on in my simulations is, or well, these are my latest two publications, I just used um, a vehicle computer to run the algorithms. So um, give you a little bit more insight on what such a submicroscopic microscopic hill simulation um, I've just explained to you looks like. Um, I'm going to show you more. So uh, over here we have our ego vehicle. 
uh, which is the vehicle over here. This is a video, I'm going to play it um, in a few seconds. So the vehicle uh, is over here. Then we have a cyclist over here, which responds, responds to the cyclist over here. We have a park vehicle, which is this one over here. And our ego vehicle is going to try to turn right, which is going to cause conflict with the cyclist, which can either turn right here or can go straight. The ego vehicle doesn't know that, but it has to account for it. So, and um, yeah, these are the only ones. The other vehicles with the road network, we have stop lines, we also have traffic lights, and we can see our vehicles right now. I hope you can read it in the stop mode. So, just go here, clear this one, and start the video. I'm going to pause it in a second here. So, we're starting. My vehicle is approaching the stop line. And you can see that cyclist over here is assigned to the road network and is tracked along the path. And we can see that we will probably have a conflict in the future. You can see the other vehicles right now. Um, I have a green face and can go. And we are waiting for our green face at the stop line. The traffic light will turn green in a second. Right now. And what we can see now is that the vehicle starts uh, moving, starts the right turning maneuver. And what we can also see, we get uh, collisions um, in the simulation uh, for the vehicle. So we will, right now we're in follow mode. As soon as we're in this section, we're going to yield to the other, to the cyclists. And again, on the right side, you can see that everything in 3D. On the left side, which is running on the vehicle computer, on the ROS part, our hardware, the loop simulation part. Uh, the vehicle completes the right turn without any conflict. And that's uh, one simulation run. OK. Um, then, go on a second. So what I've done with my simulations in the past, just a small thing here, like we had a hardware loop test using infrastructure based emergency tra trajectories for automated driving um, from 2020. And this year, I've published two papers um, at IV and ITSC IEEE conference, um, which one is the benefit of smart infrastructure on urban automated driving using AV testing framework, which is the one you've just seen before. and uh, Cyclist safety in urban automated driving submicroscopic hill simulation, which is um, an early version or an early version of the something that you've seen before. Okay, let's um, start with the workshop. So that was a little bit about my backdrop, background. And now, if I want to do this kind of research, how do I select the scenario? Um, basically, I start with what's my question? In this case, my question is, how can smart infrastructure enhance the performance of an automated vehicle in an urban environment? So how do I go on? I just say, okay, I review relevant literature or data. And next up, I'll build up my scenario based on my findings or your findings. So just, um, I'm going, not going to give a whole literature review right now, just, um, a brief approach how to go there. So I know we have a lot of uh, conflicts and in urban intersections. So I'm looking at, uh, right now we're looking at an accident participation distribution in urban intersections. And what we can see here with cars and bikes and car and car accidents. So cars hitting bikes and cars hitting cars, we have the highest percentage of um, yeah, uh, accidents here. So this is a relevant, um, yeah, relevant factor. So accidents between bikes or cyclists and cars is a relevant problem. And if we see why these, if we look at why these um, accidents are happening, so it's mainly occlusion. 
And if we look at occlusion, we're talking about parked and stopped vehicles for 56%. So right now we know that our problem is in urban intersections, um, cyclists having accidents with cars and these accidents mainly occur because of occlusions. So I have to simulate or have to create a scenario for this case. And yeah, that's how I came up with this intersection which is a digital twin of an urban intersection in Munich, where I exactly encounter at the right turns, occlusion by parked vehicles. And now, how do we exactly create uh, scenarios? Hatim already did a good introduction on scenario, different standards and that stuff. Um, what we're focusing on at our research group is the open standards from ASA. So we have open drive and open scenario that's what we're focusing on. Uh, now we can show you a little bit about the Open Drive app. So first of all, there was um, an AutoWare working group looking into map formats. And there are valid reasons to use other map formats in Open Drive. But just um, why we came to the conclusion to go with Open Drive. There's, for example, vector, vector map. The Open Drive working group came to a usability score. There's reference in it if you want to have a closer look at it of 14 of possible 35 points. Um, the problem here is that it's not public available. Then we have Laylet, which is a great format. There's also Laylet 2. Um, but compared to OpenDrive with the ASAM standardization, um, we wanted to go with the standardized pro uh, project. So the conflict for us was the proper standardization. And then there's NDS standard, which is a good standard, but it requires a license. So it's a commercial system. And then we have Open Drive, which is standardized and open. So it has um, a lot of good stuff for us in there because yeah, basically it's standardized that it's open accessible for everyone. So why Open Drive can standardized, open. And to give it one, one big system, we have an Open Drive and Open Scenario. And together we have a scenario description with dynamic and static content. Um, yeah. then. Open Drive It's basically just to give you a little bit of an insight on how this is structured, what do you have available? We have curbs, we have borders, driving lanes, medians, curbs, and all the, all the stuff needed. Um, there, there's more in there, but just to give a brief understanding of it. Um, next up, I'm going to give you a six or seven minute um, workshop video on how do we generate Open Drive maps. Just going to check if I have the availability of my video sound right now here. Just give me one second. Yeah, include sound, sound should be included. And just um, give me a hint if the video is not working properly. Hello again. Um, no. We'll start with a small workshop on creating the Open Drive map with Roadrunner. Um, you can also, you can always start with very simple, just create simple roads like this one over here. And then this one, no, not this one. But yeah, that's, that's how it basically works over here. Um, just by clicking and create custom intersections over here and then you have a road that's that's basically it um what i usually do is i create a digital twin so very detailed models of the road network um and there you start off with geo-referenced aerial images so that's it and so this here is the Arcus and Theresian Street in Munich, so the crossing between those two roads. And yeah, this is al already georeferenced. We can check the georeference over here, which is this position in the world. And yeah, so I already have the georeferencing done if I want to use this for real world driving, for example. Um, now I have to add the road. Just click again over here and Obviously, that's that's not the kind of road we have in reality. So, this one is going is a two, 
lane road going the same direction. So I set both here to backwards. We're both in this direction now. I'm not too important for Roadrunner, but yeah, I, I like to do this for my 3D simulations. Um, I also work on the road boundaries and that stuff. Um, let's extend it a little bit to the back. You can also create several points, so you can generate the arcs and different styles. This uh, now I can see. Okay, that, that's not act. That's not how the road network looks in reality. So we have to extend it a little bit and just move this one. We can just extend the road size, which is quite simple. If I pull it over here. Do it like this. And if you also use like um, OpenStreetMaps, you can also incorporate OpenStreetMap files and get a more accurate road network as well. And you can also just use this one, then you have another uneven spacing, you can modify more location options with that. Um, yeah, so that's the first road done here. Um, now, I don't want to, let's say, create this road on and on all the time and recreate it like all the markings have a little complex setup. Um, I can just create an example of this one. Um, create road style, my, my new sample style. Sample style. That's it. Now I can just use this one. Right click, I'll just go over here first, right click here, here. You can see it's fine now as well. Um, then we go on over here, like this, over here, like this. And you can also add a new more more stuff like um, bicycle roads, parts and all that stuff. But I want to keep it simple and not use too much time for this topic. So um, let's uh, check here. These are in the wrong direction, obviously. Let's change this. Change this. Fine. It's fine. Um, over here, we have this one going this direction. This one has to go forward. Over here, we have the same thing. We're on right side traffic here in this German area or in every German area, basically. And this one, and here we go, we have an intersection. This is all in the Roadrunner definition, of course, right now. And let's say, okay, uh, with intersection, if I'm doing a left turn, I'm definitely not going to cut through the other road part. So. You also just moved a little bit further, so I'll go a little bit more straight first. Your road network, and this you can use for everyone for everything. Um, I think I can also add this and this. Yeah, I can also add a new one over here, so I can also enable turning left on the far the far lane and not on the near lane. I can also remove um, this one, but both. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I could do both in the left turning. Um, yeah, so this is my road network. Um, just give a little more hint. Um, driving directions over here. You can also go in, this is a shoulder. You can see it over here, it says shoulder. Here it says driving. You can also say biking and that stuff, median curb, sidewalk. Then here we have a curb. Especially interesting for planning features of Open Planner then. And then we have a sidewalk. So. That's basically it, the geo-referenced um, road network. And now we want to export this to OpenDrive. Just click on the OpenDrive export over here. This is the OpenDrive preview tool. We say driving direction right side. Uh, we don't have signals objects, but uh, never mind. We can just export it how it is. It says everything's fine. And close. And now we can see our OpenDrive network. We can see we can also check our network. We can say, okay, uh, the typical topology, if the lane ID, the predecessors, the successors, and all that stuff. We have our intersection here, the junction ID. We, we can check everything in here. So we can make sure that the, the export from Roadrunner is, is what we want to have it 
look like in the end. And when we're done with that, we can just say export. Um, there are several export options, a lot of export options actually. And we can say open drive. And it's the same again. I just enter here the name and then I say export. Yeah, thanks. i uh, talk to you in a few seconds. Thanks for listening. Hello again. Um, hello again. So, uh, welcome back. Um, just, we can just go on with the open scenario workshop. It's basically um, a quick introduction with one slide and then a workshop video. But just uh, want to ask you, Hartem, if we want to have a coffee break, because the workshop video will take about half an hour, or should we just go on with the workshop right away? I think we have time before the coffee break. OK. Uh, um, then I'll just go on. After, after next uh, tutorial, we can have the coffee break. Perfect. OK. OK. Then next up, um, uh, open scenario. Description file, it's basically an XML structure. And in the video, I'll show you in detail how you set up an open scenario file, basically video you can watch all the time and see how to set up open scenario files, set up your scenarios and that stuff. Um, over here in the image, you can see our eco vehicle in the bottom left at the starting position and the top, you can also see another actor of the, in the environment. And in the video, we're going to program our eco vehicle to go straight in an intersection and also have a little demo how this works with the scenario-based testing framework, which is going to be introduced later on by Armin. Hello and welcome to the Open Scenario File Generation tutorial. We'll start completely with a blank page, so you don't have to worry about anything. You will pick it up while we go. Um, we start with a new file. We can call it something like uh, my new scenario scenario dot xoc. Um, I'm using Visual Studio Code. It won't pick it up as XML language, so we can move this from plain text to XML over here. Go with that, and then we just start with our XML tag. Okay, just use the XML declaration. It's fine. And then we just go on, and that's the specific part, which you can just um, paste or just copy from me. It's this open scenario, XML schema instance, and and that that's quite important to use the the scheme location to use a scheme, which is this file over here, and this will help you set up the the whole the whole scenario. It just basically guides you through everything. So if you look over here, my uh, problem here is really not in the right location. So right now it's just telling me I um, cannot find declaration element. And I'll move this one to scenarios, move. Yeah. And then we have to make sure, like it's telling us over here, um, structure must start with the same entity, closing tag expected here. So let's create a closing tag for this one, which is here the yeah, just giving us the hint, telling us what to do. Um, let's keep looking. What's it else telling us? Um, child element, open scenario, following elements are expected. So we need a header. Just go over here. Open the tag and just like, okay, header, let's go. Author, that's me, Matthias. Um, date, um, that's quite tricky sometimes. You have to use a proper date. Um, Day is, I think, this is like the 28th, 26th, never mind. It's not Sunday already. Um, then we have to also say the time, which is 10, 24 minutes. Yeah, and then go on. Skip to description. We say new. Scenario, scenario, 
um, revision I don't really care here right now just for testing and then we have our header ready then we just see okay there's a red line under here um, we're also missing parameter de declaration just say okay just keep this a little bit structured parameter declaration okay come on now we're correct and print declarations um let's get this empty first what else do we need we also want we go catalog locations uh, log locations go um, let's just go here road network then it wants entities let's see what else do we want a storyboard let's go here storyboard storyboard is probably missing some child elements yeah that's correct okay let's just go over here and green structure so I don't can make can't make any typos. I just copy that. And then we have our storyboard over here. So right now um, the scheme file is just giving me everything we need. Okay. Parameter declarations. Um, I don't have anything in here yet. Let's just keep it um, important. We need a road network. That's where our open drive network comes in. So we can just use an exemplary open drive network. So our network is just we can just like every time uh, we have a logic file, which is our open drive file. The path is over here in the map folder, which is underneath here. See dot dot and then map slash test track. That's our test track that we're using for the simulations for the test drives. And where road networks available. So let's go on with entities. So for the entities, we have our scenario, scenario object. Um, our scenario object is our ego. Uh, let's assume we want to have a car just um, driving around the corner. But that's what we want to do, for example. We have a scenario object. Um, what else do we want in here? We have, what is it? We have a vehicle. It's fine. The vehicle is called ego vehicle. Okay, I uh, have typo in here. I didn't want it to have bicycle. Let's try again. Um, vehicle. Vehicle category bicycle. I clean up this into afterwards. It's an ego vehicle. And this one is a car. That's fine. Um, we have the red underlinings again so we're missing a few elements that are expected and we just go with this one axles what does axel for us one from us front axle and then we fill in the information um previously previously we've used um, max steering yeah max steering 30 degrees position of the front axle let's keep it with two 0.98 meters c is probably what do we have here 0 0.4 no, doesn't let me go there track width uh, 1.68 meters and the wheel diameter what do we have over here it's 0 0.8 meters yeah probably realistic but it doesn't really matter for us right now then let's also add the rear axle because it's probably expecting us to do this. Um, it says following elements are expected, rear axle. Let's go and make it a little bit easier. Over here, say this is our um, control X. I just copy a complete line which speeds up the process a little bit. Let's check max steering 30, position, we put it in the rear end to zero. Um, 0 0.4, 1.68, and 0 0.8. That's fine. So our axles are defined. Then the vehicle. Um, we're also missing parameter declarations. Let's go. 
give it to from the declarations. Um, I'm not trying to add something in here. We don't have any parameters declared for this vehicle. Just say and parameters go here if you need it. Okay, what else do we need? Let's see. I think they're all mandatory objects. So, bounding box. What is the bounding box of my object? So, bounding box, we add the center. Center is point O. Say Y is zero and C is zero point nine in our example file. What else do we have? Dimensions. Height one height one point eight meters. Height length is five meters. And the width is two meters. So bounding box defined. Next up we have the performance. Max acceleration two meters per second to the power of two. Max decelerations we also get the same. Max speed is let's say 10 meters per second. But and we just define it here. Um, it's uh, up to our planning system we're using for the simulations to pick up these values. So it's not necessarily exactly these accelerations if we don't feed it into the to the planning system or to the yeah to the vehicle. It's just we define it over here so we have it available. And everyone can use the properties. What's inside properties? Um, file property. Yeah, I don't think we need this right now. We can just say again. Properties go here if needed. Okay, so this is our vehicle, our ego vehicle. It's fully defined now. Our first scenario object. We don't have any other things. We just want to make it drive along the road. Okay, um, storyboard. Over the storyboard. Our storyboard gets an init. It also gets a story here. Story is drive straight and go on. Story needs a few other things. Let's keep going with the story. Then we need a story. Does we already have a story? What's telling us that we don't have a story? Ah, uh, probably it's at 45. Never mind. Um, then have a look over here in it and the story. Let's start with the in it. Um, in in it, we need actions. It's the only option over here. Then the actions are basically um, our different ones like a private action is we use a private action um, and there we say entity ref so the entities are here and we have a scenario object and we have ego scenario object over here has the name ego we we'll put it in, in here and say this is the entity reference is ego this entity now gets an action say so here okay private action and the private action is a there are different actions available. It's our init action. So when the scenario starts, you want to initialize our whole scenario. We have a teleport action. We teleport it to the position we want it to start our ego vehicle. So let's go here, position. And we want the world position. And I'm going to tell you can also import in here the heading. You can also add it in here. And we just keep it to zero because um, let's make it a float value zero. And right now it's going to start at zero point zero point zero. Oh, yeah. Um that's the init action for our vehicle. So next up, um, we need to add something to our story. What should happen? What's our story basically? And there we have available an act. 
get an act. What is our act? Um, our act is, let's call it ego driving act. It's the name of our act. And we go on. Let's see, we have a maneuver group, min execution count and name. Fill it, it's one. And name, we say ego maneuver. Also, always misspell maneuver. But uh, that, that doesn't really matter here. <laughs> um, maneuver group. And there we go. On. Maneuver group also needs input, it needs actors. Select uh, triggered entities. Uh, no, it's not triggered, it's always like that. Then we have entity reference. Entity reference again is our ego, like before when we had our um, reference. It's basically another action reference. Here is our ego, and we also want to tell him, okay, we're done. Actors, entity ref, that's fine. So the next thing we want to do is give our actor here a maneuver. Um, our new maneuver here is go and drive. Doesn't really matter for us right now. Then paramedic declarations, we don't need that. Just fill it. Um, then we have an event. Event name is what do we do previously? Let's say drive event priority is override we can keep it like it is then we go for event uh, event needs more input it's an action action is driving action then we can fill uh, i think it's a private action again not before this one is a teleport action is it tele tele teleport action it's a routing action sorry for that go back we want a routing action here and we say I think acquire position action correct and then we go to position again and we say it's a world position and we also add the heading And right now we just set it to 0, 0 0.0. So, and that should be fine. We have an act. What's missing here? Maneuver group and start trigger. We have maneuver group. It's missing the start trigger. Let's give him a start trigger. here um, start trigger is condition group condition rising 0.0, .0 and we call it sim time condition is by value condition and we say simulation time condition equal to and then zero point zero. We just want it to start right away without anything else. Okay. Now no more get rid storyboard is still missing something. And stop trigger is missing. If in it we have story and let's give him a stop trigger. Okay. Um, our simulation usually stops itself, but ah yeah, that that's where we're using our simulation stop feature, which um, we set up to stop the simulation if we hit um, a maximum time limit. Again, rising delay is here zero point zero, and the name is time limit condition is here we say 
by value condition, I guess. Yes. Then we go on with simulation time condition. It's this one. And we say it's greater than. And for example, we say greater than. In this case, let's say 5.0 seconds. So right now the vehicle will start in the nowhere. Yeah, so no more red lines. Vehicle will start in the nowhere. Um, we'll get position to itself. Let's have actually have the position position somewhere else so we get the stop trigger. So the simulation stops after five seconds. Um, go and drive. All right, driving action. Acquire position, and we say 100. And actually, we have to change one more thing, which is the vehicle name, the name of our ego vehicle, which must be ego, because this is um, the setup of our testing framework, which is looking for the vehicle name ego in here. Okay, um, then we're ready to go. Let's have a new terminal over here, and we're using the ROS launch and. The name was Simran the second over here. It's um, for book start with Simran. This is just Ross, Ross command stuff. Ross launch, Simran run launch. Um, let's move this one over here. I want it in the side. That's it. Um, then we get Arvis over here. And that's our test track for our simulations. We have tight corners. We have wide corners, we have intersection, we have stop lines. So just uh, to cover some comes some scenarios. This over here is our zero point. It's the middle of the area. See it over here. And right now what's going to happen is we've told the system to start at zero point zero zero and go to something with 100 and the planner is not going to find a solution to the problem and the uh, simulation should terminate five seconds after we started it don't worry about this message it's just that usually we're running 20 files so it's starting up um local global path not published we're waiting for the now it started and can generate global waypoint nodes and map so exactly we said can't find the path um, but there we have our goal which is with the one we've defined now we go down there and yeah that's somewhere over here it just shut down everything and the simulation is stopped again and we've generated a new test and the test said okay we were not successful because we couldn't couldn't find the goal but it was basically an error of us generating the scenario so let's say we want to go like we said we want to go straight let's just say go down here and a very easy way to do is to do this is you can just say um, we say Ross topic echo slash and that's an easy one move base simple goal is this one is that enough goal so okay we want to start over here with this orientation then we have this information over here we want to start from here and that's what we have to enter in the world position that's our init we want to in initialize our vehicle here private action teleport action and that's where we want to start. Um, what we have to do still is, it's a quaternion, we have to transform this to our yaw angle. So, let's just go over here. You can use just some online calculator for this one. Our W value is this one, 0 0.69, just put it over here, 0 0.698. And we have for the C value, minus, 0.717 and apply rotation and we get in radians that's our orientation our heading we want for the starting position and we also use the same one because we're just going straight for the goal position so that should not be an issue um, use this one over here as well 
remove the zero, we don't need that. And the position is minus 22, minus 22 dot 078 dot, yeah, 07, yeah, 08, that's it. And then on Y, we want 9.74, 9, 91.74 to be correct. And let's go back here. Let's give it a goal. So, okay, we want to drive to this position. Enough goal over here. Let's go. We want to go to the X position minus 21 point nine eight and the y position is twenty two point oh eight twenty two point oh eight and now the vehicle should start driving and the simulation should just stop because we're violating the time limit let's go again start it up and here we are where we want it to be and we say, okay, we're starting. And there we stop because of the time delay. Let's increase the time value to 60 seconds. This should be sufficient. And restart the simulation. It's just visualization. This one should be published again. Now we're good to go. Forward, running. And reaching our goal point and stop. Fine. And we've just configured our open scenario file to run with the testing framework, which is I'm inshallah going to explain to everyone in the following talks. We also have um, examples for objects, but it's basically all the same. You initialize the position of the object to give it a driving goal and it's if you've done it once it, it's kind of self-explanatory so thanks for your can attention and talk to you in a few seconds so welcome back to the uh, yeah live session and thank you for your attention and i'm welcome to take questions and I think already is one question in the chat um, about how could you ensure, uh, thanks for illustration. One quick question, how could you ensure check the map here is preparing the real world? Yeah, we've, we've had that one before. Um, we have on the one side for the, I think we're talking about the open drive map and we were using um, high accurate position with our just uh, retrieve a high secure position with our eco vehicle. And then we've used a point cloud uh, with a LiDAR sensor. And then you can also insert um, a point cloud image into the road runner. And then you can see exactly where everything is located and get a more 3D visualization. Of everything. I hope um, you understand what I mean. If not, uh, just can also ask again or are there any other questions? You're welcome. Uh, hi, um, I have a question. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, I can hear you, perfect. Okay, so um, I think one of the most difficult steps here is the um, creation of open drive, right, uh, map right? and uh, I saw you use uh, Roadrunner, and this software is, is, is not free, right? Is it? it that's correct. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, the, you, you're perfectly uh, right. Um, Roadrunner is not for free, and for now, that was the most comfortable way to create open drive maps for me. Uh -huh. Probably in the future, there will be another tool. Uh, but for now, um, to use the testing framework, for example, um, it's important to mention that you can use the predefined open drive map we have mm. created, or we could also do for the test framework. Like if someone wants just, okay, I need a road at this and this position, just uh, create an issue in the 
on GitHub and we can create that road for you. And then mm -hmm. everyone can run the scenarios because they are basically XML syntax and uh, accessible. I see. Thank you very much. Yeah, but that, that's a very valid question, very valid point there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Just one question. Is it possible to use this open drive map in the autover without any problem? Um, right now, with, we're just testing it with Open Planner. Uh -huh. And with Open Planner, it is in our branch working right now. And I think Hatim already merged it into his latest release. So I wouldn't uh -huh. say without any um, problems or errors because okay. it's, yeah. But and, uh, according to the tests, it should work right now. Okay, and if we want to match the, this uh, map with the point cloud, just if we upload the map, the georeference map, or not the georeference map into the, this software, does it have any issue or just it's match on the point cloud? Um, it depends. So. The georeferenced image we're using, they are from the government. They are quite good, but it's like yes, they have an accuracy. Uh, yeah. Yes, but it's important for us to use the point cloud georeference. Then uh, it, how we can just merge this together, how we can adjust this map on the point cloud. Because in the lane um, that we can use the open street map, for example, to adjust this map in the point cloud, but uh, how we can adjust this one, the open drive map. So you mean the Roadrunner creation workflow? Yes, yes. You said that mm -hmm. just the same software yeah. that you use. Yeah. yeah. So in Roadrunner, you can define the roads uh -huh. and you can import the point cloud image. You can import um, georeference image and you can also import open street map. You can import all this information and combine all of that you can create the road network and modify it. Ah, so okay, it then, uh -huh. okay, then we can match the, this open drive map on our point cloud on, this, on the same software. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I think there is one, one question in the uh, chat. Oh, yeah. A little question two or more entities, vehicles, pedestrians, etc., interact with each other. How could Open Drive describe these interactions? Um, the interactions are described in the open scenario file. If I'm just, yeah, maybe I'm wrong, but it should be described in the open scenario file. And that's a good question. How do if I have more entities like two other objects, how they interact with each other. Um, I haven't tested this yet. What we've done so far is we have, for example, our ego approaching intersection and have a start trigger for another vehicle which then um, creates a conflict intersection or just, but if I think the question is, we have two other objects and they want to, you want to influence them each other. It should just be the same as um we were doing with the obstacles for example ego is driving at a specific position if the ego reaches this position or any object reaches position we you can set a trigger for the other object to start its own act so if we if you look into the other examples um of the testing framework this should be just another trigger to the other object i hope this answers your question sufficiently Okay, thank you very much for your uh, information. Thank you. And uh, 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 that, that means if, uh, uh, you know, there will be sometimes 20 vehicles or 20 pedestrians in the same uh, scenes so that it will be uh, uh, about 20 triggers or even more to describe all pedestrian or all vehicles, uh, you know, status. Um. Yeah, I think so. So for every pedestrian, for every object, you have to create it in this file and write the triggers. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. I think we have uh, time for one more question uh, before the coffee break. Okay. Any question? So then, um, Hatem, I want to thank you for organizing this and want to thank everyone for attending this session. And yeah, wish you a good break. Thank you very much. Actually, it's really, it was really. Uh, um, nice and detailed how to create, uh, especially the open scenario file. I enjoyed it myself. Uh, and uh, we are now we'll go for uh, 15 minutes break and then we'll come back with the uh, session three of uh, this workshop. Thank you everyone for, uh, for staying with us and uh, only 15 minutes and then we will come back. Thank you. Welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, now we will start uh, session uh, three. Uh, and uh, in this session, uh, uh, Armin uh, from the Oxford University of Applied Sciences will introduce uh, his work uh, on uh, open source testing framework for path planning and control algorithms in autonomous driving. Uh, thank you, Armin. Uh, you can start. So, hello, everyone, from my side. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Great. Uh, then I'll just go on. So, a big back, uh, quick background to me. Um, I'm currently working as a research stu student at the University of Applied Sciences in, uh, in Augsburg. And I'm doing my master thesis on path planning for autonomous vehicles in structured environments. And I've been working for the past year on the research question on how can scenario-based testing improve the development process of path planning algorithms. And uh, during this period of time, I came up with uh, the solution I'm presenting to you today. Uh, the contents of uh, this uh, section of the workshop uh, will be uh, the requirements for uh, the scenario-based testing frameworks, which do you have to know, uh, or what, what stuff do you have to know uh, to uh, go along, and uh, quick uh, reference to uh, the introduced uh, open standards uh, by, by Matthias. And uh, then I will uh, give you an overview of the framework, uh, how it works in detail, and uh, what uh, things you uh, have to consider when using it. Also, I will give you a detailed overview about building and configuring the Docker container uh, it is uh, provided uh, within, uh, then on how to execute it, and finally on how to interpret and view the results. So uh, first, let's go to the requirements. And uh, here, uh, the first major ones are Docker and ROS. And I will give just a brief introduction uh, in case uh, somebody doesn't know them. Uh, Docker is a, a containerization uh, tool that allows you to abstract the infrastructure you are using, so your computer and the OS that is installed and therefore um, the containerized um, framework can be executed on any computer um, running Docker. Or, or for example, also on servers for uh, continuous integration testing. And ROS is the robot operating system, uh, which is a toolbox for the development of um, robotic systems. And this is what uh, AutoWare is built on, and uh, therefore what I'm, what Open Planner is using, and therefore also what I'm using to build a, a testing framework. Also, you have to be familiar with Open Drive and Open Scenario, but uh, you, you are since you are in this workshop, and Matthias explained this to you uh, previously. 
Great. Uh, so uh, next, um, I'll come to the uh, framework overview. Um, it, uh, its architecture um, mainly consists of uh, the scenario database and uh, the simulation resources required to run it, as well as a Docker container uh, with uh, Linux uh, distribution installed in it that already has all the ROS uh, components uh, pre-installed. Uh, then the test framework components um, and the test object itself. And the output of uh, all of this is a, um, a folder um, containing the simulation or the, the testing results. Uh, and uh, the container itself also brings a web server with it so you can view them in the browser. So uh, the framework uh, consists of uh, several ROS nodes. Uh, which have to be executed simultaneously for the uh, uh, simulation to work. Um, and uh, each scenario is uh, executed uh, in, in a serial manner. So uh, each is, is executed after each other and therefore the simulation manager starts and stops each simulation based on the previously specified triggers, as Matthias showed you this five sec second trigger um, is uh, there the simulation manager realizes, okay, five uh, seconds are over. I will just stop this uh, scenario run. Then there is uh, the evaluator uh, that you have to be aware of. It uh, basically subscribes during the entire execution of the, uh, of the scenario test. To the, to the ROS topics of interest and stores them in a JSON file, which can then later on be evaluated. Um, as an input to uh, all of this, the two um, scenario and open uh, drive files are used. And uh, these are just have to lie within the uh, order uh, in the folder structure um, as, uh, as defined. And then the ROS nodes will load them automatically. Uh, as a test object, in our case, um, Open Planner uh, is, is tested. And uh, Open Planner requires several, uh, um, several uh, topics to work, which uh, basically are the, the goalposts, um, the, the objects uh, it has to avoid, as well as uh, updated ego pose and ego velocity. And its output then is a control command, uh, which is uh, fed into the uh, vehicle kinematics model uh, that is part of the testing framework. It's just a basic uh, geometric single track model uh, with not too much complexity to it. Uh, this is um, more about the general architecture and not about the uh, detail uh, in, the, in the simulation. Um, for the open scenario to uh, to be to be published, there is a, a separate node which uh, reads the scenario contents and publishes all defined obstacles at the rate of ten hertz for the planner to to work with. That's it for the overview. Uh, the evaluation of the of the planner performance is uh, done using the common road cost functions. And uh, at this point, I want to mention common road by itself. It's a um, composable benchmark solution for motion planning on roads. Um, that's also what the, uh, the acronym is standing for. And it basically uh, delivers a huge uh, scenario set uh, that can be used for benchmarking of motion planners. And uh, you have to execute your motion planner locally, then generate a solution, which then is uploaded to the Common Road website for evaluation. And then they, they rank your motion planning solution. And for this, they are using a cost function, uh, which evaluates the uh, motion planner performance. 
And for the scenario-based testing framework, I am using a subset of those common road selected cost functions. And uh, I initially planned on integrating all of them, but uh, it didn't fit into my time schedule. So if anybody wants to add this, um, I'm open for uh, pull requests on that side. It would be highly appreciated. On the right-hand side, you can see the cost functions I'm currently use using. It's um, uh, the entire driving time. Then two special ones, it's a stop trigger, uh, which is a Boolean flag uh, describing whether or not the scenario had to be uh, killed by the simulation manager. Uh, also a collision flag, which is just a Boolean flag, whether or not there was uh, a collision at any point in time during this scenario execution. Both of these can then be used to uh, give a direct, like an, an instant indicator of whether or not this scenario was um, a valid run or not, since as soon as it had to be stopped or that did a or that it happened a collision, it's definitely not valid. All of the other cost functions uh, then can be used to uh, compare different simulation runs or testing runs to each other. For example, there are integrated um, dynamic properties of the Eagle vehicle like acceleration jerk, steering angle, steering rate, and yaw rate. Uh, which uh, add up to, to integrated or summed up costs. And there's also a distance to other objects as well as distance to the closest center line. Um, those are there for uh, more detailed analysis um, later on. So as soon as the uh, tests were executed, um, there, is, uh, there are some things you have to consider when interpreting the test results. Uh, the motion you see is uh, a combination of planning and control. Um, this, for example, can lead to uh, cut corners when driving um, like a right turn on an intersection. Um, if the purses controller um, has a two great look ahead distance configured, then the corner is cut. And this isn't a planning error, and but this is a control error, but you won't be able to see it since the planned trajectory is actually not visualized uh, to decrease the amount of data. Um, at this point, uh, we are assuming that the uh, scenario-based testing framework is used as a tool for developers which are familiar with their own path planning software and therefore just want to run um, the continuous integration tests or uh, frequent tests to uh, check whether or not software updates are valid and uh, are work across a wide uh, variety of scenarios. Exactly. And so that's it when interpreting the test results. Uh, next, I will give you a practical guide on how to use the framework. I will go through this quite quickly since most of the things will be mentioned a second time in the video guide where I'm showing you how to do it in detail. But I think it's uh, good to see it before so you can then um, elaborate on it further whilst seeing the video. So first you have to configure and build a Docker container. Therefore you have to install Docker. There's an online guide for that. And you should also uh, ensure that you can run commands with sudo uh, when installing it. Then you should clone the uh, Docker um, container, uh, like the repository containing the Docker file and the resources for the web server. Then there are, as a brief explanation of the Docker file, you uh, should, like it installs automatically all the dependencies and required uh, Python packages for you. It uh, runs git clone for the actual ROS simulation uh, framework. It builds all the ROS nodes uh, as well as the, it also clones the, the, test, uh, the test object, the open planner. 
you can specify the used branches in the uh, or the used repositories in the, in the repo file. And, and finally, uh, opens a web server and runs the Rust launch sim run run launch command, which you've seen previously um, in Matthias demo. Then afterwards, uh, you build the Docker container. This takes between 30 minutes and one hour, depending on your internet connection and the speed of your machine. And afterwards, you can already execute it. Here, uh, it, there are two options when executing it. You either can uh, forward a port uh, with the web server uh, for viewing the results. Uh, this is done by the P flag. Um, or you can uh, like mount a folder, like the internal reports folder to, to your uh, host machine. And uh, this is done using the V flag. During the execution, you can also uh, access the Docker container uh, by running docker exit uh, dash IT, uh, then enter the container name and bash. Uh, but this is shown in more detail in the demo. And uh, finally, uh, you can view and interpret the results uh, in the web server or the, the folder. When you are using the browser, you just have to enter localhost 8080 uh, into the browser. And if you use uh, the, uh, the folder or uh, a shared zip archive, if anybody shares his uh, uh, raw scenario testing results with you, then you probably you receive them in a zip archive. We are using this internally to store different uh, uh, results for different versions of our planners. Uh, and then you uh, could, for example, use the live server extension for Visual Studio Code just um, to host the report.html file. And then you get uh, this view kind of um, with um, green or red dots, depending on whether or not the uh, scenario was executed successfully, as well as an overview of the uh, driving performance uh, in a map view, as well as the dynamic uh, properties of the vehicle. Uh, also, there's a, a table um, showing the costs. Uh, these are uh, just um, displayed here as the, the computer cost as well as the weighted cost, uh, while the weighted cost um, just uses some, um, some factors to um, make, for example, the distance to obstacles a bit more important for the final cost, as well as the jerk a bit less important uh, since, uh, yeah, those are quadratic, uh, this is quadratic and therefore um, it shouldn't be considered that, that much. Uh, also, you can see those, um, those plots here. Those are um, plotly charts, um, which can also be stored as a PNG if you want to share them uh, later on or store them or add them to any kind of other report. So um, this is it so far for the, for the presentation. And uh, now I will share with you the uh, video demo of the download installation and execution process. Hello everyone, today I would like to share with you my testing framework for path planning and control algorithms in automated and autonomous driving and I have prepared a quick uh, tutorial with a uh, step-by-step um, walkthrough of the installation and usage process. Um, it, uh, all of it starts with the installation of uh, Docker 
uh, Docker is a containerization um, framework and uh, I'm using a blank uh, Ubuntu machine here. It runs uh, Ubuntu 18.04 uh, and uh, previously no Docker is installed. Um, and I'm showing this uh, by typing docker dash we and it shows the install instructions uh, and yeah the, that's the current state of the machine and by navigating to the github repository of the um, raw ci docker uh, you can obtain the install instructions for docker but you can also just google them and uh, here everything is uh, documented what you need to do um, I'm using the process, uh, process uh, with the convenience script, um, which uh, can just be uh, triggered by copying those two lines here and pasting them into the terminal for execution. Uh, this takes a while. I will fast forward through the process. The next step is uh, cloning the uh, GitHub repository into um, a new folder. Uh, therefore, we uh, go back to the browser and navigate back to the uh, GitHub repository, uh, copy the uh, line for uh, cloning uh, the OCI Docker repository, uh, and first making a new uh, directory with mkdir. Uh, we are calling the workshop and we navigate to it, and here we execute the, the clone command. It just takes a few seconds and Afterwards, we uh, can uh, uh, start the, the, the Docker build. Um, here, I, I just messed up and uh, tried to uh, build the Docker container in the wrong directory. Uh, first, we have to navigate to the correct directory and then execute the Docker build command. Um, and we get an error that we can't connect to the Docker daemon and this can be easily resolved by uh, starting the docker daemon um, you uh, can google uh, how it works um, just type in the error message and then you can get to a stack overflow uh, and uh, here you enter system control start docker you have to enter your password and then docker starts and in the next step we are also adding our uh, current user to the docker group which enables us to run uh, commands with sudo within the docker container and uh, this uh, makes stuff a lot easier and the docker files can be written in a more more general way yeah uh, next we open the docker file to see what's in there um, before we execute it this is always a good idea uh, and yeah it uh, just uh, initially uh, gets the base ROS uh, melodic uh, docker container which uh, we build then on. Uh, we install some Python packages and some do some basic uh, updates, uh, ROS dependency updates and so on. Uh, then afterwards we clone the GitHub repository for ROS scenario simulation and uh, import the planner um, using uh, repos file uh, the, the contents of this file and the repositories used for the planner can be specified and then it's built with called and build and uh, the uh, working directory is uh, changed we uh, um, get the uh, uh, ROS uh, launch script and uh, yeah finally uh, uh, start the uh, web server and uh, execute the launch scripts. Um, but first, um, we have to actually build the uh, Docker container uh, as uh, done so by entering the uh, command here. And then uh, first the, the base uh, Docker container, uh, including ROS is downloaded and uh, this takes uh, some moments um, depending on your internet connection afterwards uh, all of the uh, previously mentioned steps are uh, executed and uh, therefore installed on your local um, docker container 
and uh, this takes uh, between 30 minutes and one hour uh, depending on your internet connection and your processor speed um, and also the planner is built using Kotlin build as explained and this takes a while uh, and uh, I will fast forward through this process and come back to you as soon as it's finished. Here we can see the uh, Docker uh, container build uh, finished successfully. Um, we have a um, Docker image now, uh, which is tagged as CI slash uh, uh, scenario sim. And uh, now we can uh, use the command from the GitHub repository uh, to uh, run the Docker container. It uh, links the internal port 90 to the external port 80, uh, 8080 and uh, we can access that on the web browser as soon as the uh, web server is up and running. Uh, since the web start, uh, server started first and afterwards the, uh, the ROS scenario uh, testing framework is started, we uh, can immediately access it in our uh, local browser. And here you can see the web UI, uh, but it currently has no uh, files written to it, even if we refresh it, since uh, no uh, simulation scenario is finished at this point. Uh, uh, all, of, all of them are still in, execu in execution, all of them are uh, executed one after another, and therefore it uh, always takes uh, like between 30 and 60 seconds for each scenario to finish and in the end you will have multiple files in the um, overview. Here I'm opening a new terminal uh, to show you how to access the Docker container whilst execution from another terminal window. Um, you use docker exit uh, minus it, uh, then you press tab to get the uh, uh, your container's uh, uniquely generated name and then you enter bash uh, for the application you want to run and then you start in the uh, directory that you had entered last in the docker file and uh, already like all standard U Ubuntu commands work like ls uh, minus la uh, which shows you the contents of the ROS scenario sim uh, simulation folder you can, for example, also hit cat readme and then you get the contents of the readme, uh, which is um, also visible in the GitHub repository. And uh, yeah, to uh, execute Docker, uh, sorry, ROS commands, you first have to source the ROS environment and uh, therefore you enter source, uh, uh, you enter source. Uh, uh, root, uh, ROS scenario simulation, then the devil folder, and afterwards the setup.bash. And uh, this sources the files for you, and afterwards you can use standard uh, ROS commands like ROS CD. Uh, here, uh, ROS CD to the scenario uh, sim folder is executed. Uh, yeah, here the contents are shown. Uh, as you can see, it's just the regular uh, file structure as you. Uh, should be familiar with from a ROS node and afterwards you for, can for example run ROS topic info on any topic here uh, current post is shown uh, no uh, nobody publishes it currently so we should be in a state in between different scenarios with the overall scenario execution uh, now it started again so we should be able to see uh, the publishers and subscribers of current posts The next step, we are echoing current pose, and you can see that it's published uh, at 10 hertz, like frequently. The position is uh, static at this point. This is uh, probably due to the vehicle I haven't started driving yet. In the meantime, we can take a look at the web UI and uh, see how uh, the executed scenarios are visualized. Uh, therefore, we head to the browser and refresh it and uh, we see that there are multiple scenarios finished already 
and we will, uh, can, for example, take a look at the uh, road fully blocked scenario, which uh, is a scenario where the eco vehicles drives on a straight road and there is a big obstacle um, close to the center line of the road and the uh, eco vehicle has to approach it and drive around it. And uh, you can see, you can zoom in using the plus and minus buttons and you can see that it uh, passes this quite closely but does not have any collisions. And when scrolling down, you can see the dynamic properties of the Eagle vehicle, like its velocity, its acceleration, also the jerk, as well as the steering angles and uh, steering rates and the yaw rate. That's it uh, basically for the overview. And uh, now we can take a look again at the position. It uh, did change between the last scenario and this scenario, but uh, we, uh, for some reason still can't see a dynamic update, but uh, that's not too important. You, you can see that the sequence is updating, so uh, it, it's basically working. We just uh, missed the, the point again where it's actually driving. Finally, we are taking a look at the uh, tight corner drive scenario, which was marked as a failure with the red uh, dot. Um, and we can see that the Eagle vehicle is uh, still standing still at its start position and for some reason didn't start to drive. Also the stop trigger was triggered, like uh, this scenario did last for 60 seconds and the vehicle didn't move, so uh, there was an error. And we can also see that the dynamic properties all are uh, staying at zero and there must have been some type of error with the uh, planner. It might not have received the global pose or uh, might not have been able to plan a global path from this position to the end position and the developer, the developer now knows that he will have to investigate this case and uh, test on it in more detail and uh, figure out a solution for the uh, occurring problems. So uh, that's it from my side. Um, this was the presentation for the scenario simulation framework. I hope you learned a lot about it and uh, will be able to replicate uh, the steps I showed to you and uh, therefore be able to test your uh, path planning algorithms and improve your, uh, the behavior and the safety of your autonomous vehicles. Enjoy the rest of the workshop and have a nice day. Bye! Hello everyone! So, uh, since there was a goodbye from the past, I mean, um, hello again, uh, live. And um, I would like to uh, welcome some questions here and uh, answer them. I also have prepared the Docker um, container running in the background live. So we should be able to take a look at uh, everything um, even in more detail. Okay, there is a first question in the chat. Uh, do you mind sharing uh, here what is the URL to the web visualizer you used in this video? And uh, it was partially blocked. And uh, the web visualizer was running live in the Docker container. It's um, part of the testing framework. It uh, is a JavaScript application publishing uh, yeah, rectangles to a canvas. Uh, I coded myself. Uh, so uh, you get this uh, together with the testing framework, but you can also look up the code in the GitHub repository of the testing framework. I hope this answers your question. Hello. Hello. Hello, Armin. Uh, this is Mohamed Tufail. I'm from France, and I'm also working on Open Planner. And I saw your uh, presentation. Thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, I just have one quick question. Uh, when there is a scenario failure, like the one where which we saw about tight corner, uh, is there some information regarding the error that caused the failure, or we have to check it on ourselves? You uh, will then have to check that uh, by yourself. Um, with uh, this uh, specific failure, it's hard to check since the uh, 
lock won't uh, see anything uh, since, it, since it doesn't record the output to the, uh, to the terminal of the ROS nodes. Mm -hmm. um, but after the execution, the uh, ROS locks are still ava available within the Docker container. So you could just grab them from there and at least analyze those. Okay. Okay, uh, that's fine. Uh... That's all for me. That's what I wanted to know. Okay, thank you once again for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, what is Ar Armin? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just uh, for uh, installing, just there is a, this a Docker solution or can we install from the source in our computer or just we, sh we should use the Docker? Uh, you can definitely install it on your computer from source as well. Um, uh -huh. This this is what was uh, what Matthias was using previously to show you. Um, uh -huh. It also works. It's just easier to get uh, as the entire Docker container, uh, and also uh, the the requirements uh, for it to execute uh, are written into the Docker file. So if you want to install it by yourself, then you will have to install these as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. If you execute it from source, then there are many benefits, like, uh, for example, the uh, uh, the all the ROS commands work um, as you are used to it. Like, you don't have to open an additional uh, bash to the Docker container. You can just mm -hmm. simply open a new terminal and uh, use the ROS commands there. Okay. Also, okay. Arvis is working um, like normal. Uh huh. Okay. And then I think it's easy for us because then we can just write the scenario and put in the software and then test it. Uh, definitely, yeah. Uh, the mm -hmm. Docker container um, provides an additional level of comfort if you want to run a CI tests, for example then you uh -huh. could just add this Docker container to a server and execute it automatically uh, whenever you push uh, new code to your GitHub containing the test object. Like as soon as Hartem updates something on the open planner, then uh -huh. the uh, testing framework could be triggered within the, uh, in the CI pipeline. Ah, okay, okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? If this is not the case, um, I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Also, uh, many thanks to the collaboration between Nagoya University and University of Applied Sciences Augsburg. It's a great opportunity to work together on this uh, on this topic, and uh, it already helped uh, so much with the performance and evaluation of uh, our software here in Augsburg. So, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Armin, uh, that was a really nice uh, presentation. Uh, we, uh, myself, enjoyed a lot. Uh, and uh, also, I would like to tell everyone that we will share this information later. So if you missed something in the tutorial, uh, you can catch up later from the instructions. And if you want to ask more questions, you can also join our working group. We meet every two weeks. Uh, to discuss uh, further work and uh, more uh, development on uh, Open Planner and AutoWare. Uh, so, um, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, announce the break. We have a longer break now for uh, about one hour. Uh, we will come back uh, at uh, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Japan time. So yeah, maybe one hour after one hour from now. Uh, after the break, we will 
uh, take a, a small tutorial about using Carla simulator and run, run scenarios on using scenario runner and uh, both the code based and the open scenario uh, based, uh, which if I wanna connect this to what Armin just did, for example, Armin, like, he runs several scenarios uh, automatically and there is one failure, one failure with difficult explanation. There is no detail of explanation. You can take that scenario and go to like Carla or like separately, which we call it manual or the uh, the micro uh, scenario, mi micro testing of the ev micro evaluation. So you can take that scenario and test it uh, separately uh, as you will see in the next tutorial uh, and see more detail about uh, the uh, what what was the cause of the uh, of the failure? Uh, thank you very much again, everyone, and we will uh, see you again uh, in one hour and five minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, now we will start uh, session four. Uh, first. Um, a practical tutorial about using Carla simulator for scenario-based testing. Then our colleague uh, from the university, Tian Yafu, will uh, introduce his PhD research about generating simulator-ready scenes from real-world data. So let's uh, get started. Um, this is the, the tutorial I will uh, present now, getting um, which include the, the Carla simulator and uh, using scenario runner and open scenario. Uh, because there is a code running, it's recorded like the one from uh, uh, Matthias and Armin. Uh, so let me uh, share and view it together. Um, Hello, this simple tutorial will introduce how to use a Carla simulator running embedded uh, scenario, the uh, Carl, Carla leaderboard, and also uh, external uh, open scenario uh, files with custom maps. So let's get Okay, uh, one second. Later, these, this is the last version scenarios and how to use open scenario with Carla. Uh, but first, uh, we need to know that the system is a bit complicated, so you need to properly install the right versions that we need to work on. Um, these are the basic installations. Uh, the version I will do this tutorial uh, on is 0.9.10.1. Um, I like to go directly to the, the GitHub. 
uh, this is the github page from carla simulator these this is the last version just scroll down uh, to the version you need uh, 0.9 10.1 um, I downloaded the this one you can download the first one because uh, I like to use evaluating the scenarios using the RSS also so this is built with the RSS capabilities so just download this folder this is the first st step uh, to download you can yes you can download the source code and build it from scratch that will add an um, additional layer of complexity. Uh, but you need to do that if you have your own custom map you want to embed into Carla. But currently, you can load any uh, open drive map. Um, but you don't have the environment, you don't have the trees, you don't have the buildings, or any of them. First, only the open drive uh, road network uh, map. Okay, so don't we don't, I already downloaded this one. Um, move to the next item, uh, which is um, downloading the scenario runner. Um, for each Carla version, you have to download the, the tag or the branch associated with the version. So this is the scenario runner uh, GitHub page. This is the tags we have. I downloaded 0.9.10.1. So all 0.9.10, this is the supported scenario runner. So I downloaded this one. Uh, then extract both in the same folder. Uh, in my home folder, I created a folder called Carla. I added the both um, um, downloaded files, extracted. Uh, the Carla simulator here, and then extracted the scenario runner here. Uh, next, uh, it's important to make sure that the Python requirements are installed. Uh, uh, each folder, like the, the simulator, has a requirement fi file and a scenario runner also. So just for example, I want to install the requirements for uh, the simulator. Uh, go to the Python API um, folder and then just uh, in the util, uh, there is a requirement. So if I open a terminal, just write pip install minus r uh, requirement and that will install the requirement I needed. Uh, then I do the same with um, the scenario runner. That's the requirement file, uh, pip install and that will do it. Okay. Uh, once we did that, we go to the next step uh, to make sure that uh, the simulator is running or run our simulator. Um, this is the command. Uh, you also can ignore OpenGL if you if you have properly uh, NVIDIA driver installed, um, and you can just check the website the, the documentation for more details about these parameters. Uh, I will just use these parameters because this, these are those are the ones I already tested with. Um, okay, let's open a terminal and go to the Carla, Carla, and then um, is our command and enter hit enter we'll find Carla is working and this is the default world is loaded uh, then uh, next step is run the manual control uh, GUI this is the one 
we can control a vehicle, a ego vehicle directly using keyboard or using a uh, game wheel. Uh, so, um, but first there is, there is some environment variables we need to set. Uh, the Carla route, scenario runner route, and the Python path. Uh, so these are important to have them loaded in the environment before we run any scenario or before even run that manual control. Uh, what I do is I took those lines and add them in the uh, bash file. Um, so here in the home folder, there is, you can find uh, dot bash open and you will find uh, at the end of this file, there is those lines, the scenario runner root, Carla root and the path uh, Python. Uh, path. Uh, and in the Python uh, path, we have the selected the proper uh, uh, Carla API's uh, egg. Uh, we are using the Python 3.7, so we selected this one. Okay, so that's set. We can move to the next uh, step. Uh, running the manual control, but it, as I, it says here, it will wait. It will not launch until there is an ego vehicle. Um, so this is running simulator and um, let's go to the scenario runner folder. and run uh, the command. Okay, launch it, the manual control, but we don't have anything. It says waiting for the Ego vehicle to be launched. Okay, so next step is Loading the open drive map. If you have a custom map or you can you can load it manually using this command python config.py from the uh, python api uh, util folder in the simulator uh, folder or um, then you can load your own uh, and give it the path full path to your uh, open drive uh, map file. But usually we can set the uh, open drive uh, file uh, path directly into the open scenario file and the scenario runner will load it, will, will go fetch it and load it automatically uh, to uh, the Carla simulator. Uh, so next step is creating a Python scenario. Uh, here we can see um, we can go to the Carla documentation scenario runner documentation and we can create some Python code uh, and override some uh, uh, use some methods uh, predefined uh, methods and add behaviors we can add our own behaviors uh, but in this tutorial we'll, we'll see only um, already created scenarios we will not create scenario from the scratch um, then next uh, loading the scenario um, uh, then we, we want in this example I will show a simple scenario like opposite vehicle running red light uh, so I'll take this command in the scenario runner and uh, we already have our simulator the controller we need the uh, scenario to be loaded. Uh, then it does in the simulator, the new map is loaded and the Ego vehicle is loaded. Now we can see in the controller uh, window, we can control this 
using the keyboard. So I will try to uh, just follow drive the car by keyboard and uh, there is another car cutting the red light um, of course it's really difficult to drive using the keyboard i will do some improvements uh, this is the end of the scenario and it gave me some uh, results and showing how long it takes and the uh, the actors included in this scenario uh, the criteria of evaluation, uh, the velocity collision test, uh, uh, the drive distance, um, and and so on, and tells me uh, whether I succeeded or failed in some of these um, on-off or rule-based evaluation. Uh, we can do the same. We can run and we can use RSS evaluation and we can or also, um, here, uh, we can um, use the custom metrics uh, also in the, if we go to scenario evaluation, we can define our own uh, cost function uh, metrics that um, calculate some different results um, than the one is calculated by default. Uh, so uh, now we we tried uh, one simple uh, scenario. Uh, we can try other scenarios. Uh, I just want to show how to load um, uh, open scenarios. Um, okay. Uh, so after executing the scenario, uh, yeah, this is very important to to note that. Uh, I drive manually using the keyboard, uh, but we can run AutoWear or other uh, any um, autonomous driving software stack connected to Carla, and it will drive and it will give the same. Uh, it will give evaluate this uh, specific uh, run or the specific system. Uh, if you want to see AutoWear actually doing this, uh, uh, please. Uh, connect to our this is a previous um, uh, workshop we have uh, introduced uh, in 2019 uh, about Carla and AutoWare uh, also you can check uh, there is additional tutorials um, on the uh, uh, Takeda lab uh, YouTube channel about using uh, Carla and AutoWare and Open Planner um, and how to um, uh, evaluate Open Planner or other or, or your control uh, functionality using uh, Carla. Um, uh, as I showed here uh, in the result we can see the evaluation we can look these evaluation and we can compare it uh, compare the different systems um, and we can develop our own evaluation metric uh, running open scenario is same uh, there is uh, also existing open scenario files uh, in uh, in carla let's try one of these um, we'll just try the scenario called follow leading vehicle. We can understand from the name of the scenario that there is a two vehicles, NPC uh, and the ego vehicle, and we want to follow the e vehicle in front. Let's just do that. Um, okay. Um, we are in the correct folder and run. Uh, actually, I turned off the control, uh, the manual control. I run manual control. Okay. Uh, now we have, this is the ego vehicle and this is the uh, other vehicle. We will try to follow uh, the vehicle in front. Um, so this, this scenario tests how, how good we can follow 
and uh, the maintaining distance uh, of the front vehicle and so on. So this can be used to test the ACC capabilities of the autonomous driving software stack. And these, uh, you see in this test, this scenario has different uh, evaluation criteria, and it succeeded in several ones, failed in uh, key plane, uh, failed in uh, check uh, driven distance. So this can give some indication about success or failure in the uh, predefined evaluation uh, metrics. Uh, with this, I conclude uh, uh, this simple tutorial. Um, of course, we will follow this with uh, additional uh, tutorials. You can follow us on the uh, YouTube channel uh, to learn more about using a more advanced evaluation uh, cost functions or metrics, uh, and also using um, more advanced uh, scenarios uh, and custom uh, open drive maps in your uh, uh, testing or evaluation for the uh, autonomous driving software stacks. Thank you for listening. Hello. Thank you very much for uh, um, listening to this presentation and um, welcome. Any question? Any question? Uh, hello? Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Just uh, one uh, question. Uh, what's the difference between this uh, Carla and the LG? And which one you prefer? do you prefer for working? Um, for running the scenario? Actually, there is no big difference. They are both uh, competing and uh, trying to uh, um, support as much standards, as much uh, open source um, uh, software stacks as possible. Uh, they both support uh, Open Drive, uh, maybe um, uh, SVL uh, more working closely with AutoWare, so you will find more support for vector maps and Lane 2, rather uh, Carla, uh, uh -huh. like a practical difference between both. Uh -huh. Um, uh, for us, we've been uh, using that for with with AutoWare AI uh, for a long time. Um, so it's more uh, we develop some tools to use it easier. So uh -huh. it, it's st still you you can choose, uh, uh, but for for us for like Open Planner, AutoWare AI, uh, or in in uh, in our working group. Uh, we we work we mainly with the Carla. We have close connection with the Carla team also. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if, if you have a close connection or you have a direct connection with the uh, SVL team, then I, I recommend you can you can start using it because you will get answers, you will get uh, news, you you will be closer to the development cycle. Uh, so this is very important uh, in the open source. Uh, community and uh, as the uh, SVL does it need a good computer or just uh, it's uh, for the process you need a, a powerful computer for a Carla also because uh, for the SVL you for, need a good computer you need powerful computer uh, oh. yeah for both uh, oh, okay and uh, depends on your configuration and your your system uh maybe they will work with the windows better than linux uh one configuration you can use um separate computer for the simulator you can run the simulator on windows or uh, or linux on a different computer and then connect through the network 
uh, you run your uh, stack, software, uh, autonomous driving stack on another computer, and you can test that. This is also okay. one successful configuration. You can uh, release the load from the uh, uh, from the, the the testing computer, uh, so the simulation will become on another uh, machine. Oh, and the, it can connect like a bridge with the bridge connection also. Uh, it, on the network, because it uses the standard network, so you don't need any bridging. Uh, no, I mean that if I connect in a finite cell in another computer, then uh, how we can connect together with the bridge or? And if the network, if they both connected, you just need, uh, uh, there is a port. You assign the port and the IP address when you connect to the same. Ah, okay, so just, okay. Uh, just uh, change that from the default IP and port to the connection IP and port, and that's it. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, any other question? Okay. Uh, if uh, no um, additional question about this part, um, uh, now I will introduce uh, uh, Tian uh, to uh, talk about uh, his work uh, and the tools uh, he has been working on and developing. Uh, please, Tian, take the. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to talk to here. Thank you, Hatem, for telling me this opportunity, and I would like to share my work. Uh, can you see the slide? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Now, let's start here. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Tian Yafu, mm -hmm. comes from Nagoya University, Graduate School of Informatics, Takeda Lab. Currently, I'm a second year PhD student, and my research topic is to find the semantic relationships between actors in traffic scenes, and using this information to increase system security. As and as a part of this research, I made some tools for transforming real world data set to a simulator-friendly format. Here, I'm very glad to share these topics here in this webinar. And today, I would like to share my work about real to synthetic, which is to generate a simulator-ready scenes from real-world data. Here are the outline of my talk today. Now, there are a great amount of open data sets from every corner of the world like new scenes, Waymo, open data set, Apollo driving, KT, et cetera. And based on these data sets, there are a great amount of trained models for nearly every aspect of self-driving, such as body box estimation, trajectory prediction, behavior recognition, risk prediction, et cetera. The value of this data set is, they comes from the real world data and maintain very realistic object distribution. However, if we want to further research these scenes, we would like to know if we slightly change the scene, what will happen for our self-driving system? Will they react as a real human? That's uh, of course what we want, or become fully paralyzed and got a great amount of internal error? That's also possible. And even more, we want to know if the self-driving system can make a correct decision in extreme situation. Like, for example, if there are a traffic light just before the echo vehicle, or sometimes the crazy drunk driver broken every traffic rules, or the sensing system got devastating error, but the system doesn't know. So for this research, our goal is quite simple. Firstly, uh, we would like to simulate these open data sets, for example, new scenes into simulator-friendly format. To this end, 
we shall translate our map data format from the new since data set to a more simulator friendly format. Here we use Open Drive. Then we can reproduce the scenes in simulator. What's more, we want to slightly modify the scene in data set, adding, removing, or modifying a specific object and see what will happen. And if our self-driving model got enough robustness or not. Finally, we may directly generate new scenes. It would be a uh, you know near realistic scenes for training and evaluate. To translate open data set to simulator, here are the things we need to do. The first step is to translate the map structure, for, uh, such as the roads, the lanes, the junctions, lane divider, traffic light, etc. This data shall be stored in open drive format so that the simulator can directly utilize them. That's a fundamental part of our work. And then we would like to translate the object status such as the vehicle, pedestrian, and save their behavior and the trajectory. That's, that's quite important. So that we can modify or sometimes reproduce them in simulator. For this data, we would like to store them in open scenario. It's an ongoing project. And finally, to generate near realistic scene, it would be quite interesting to add some other small map assets such as barriers, buildings, trees, etc. For the simulator, Sumo and the color are both excellent, easy to use simulator, and they both got their own aspect. Sumo is a macro traffic simulator for a large scale and a complex road network, while Kala is more efficient in micro traffic simulation. It can produce near realistic graph outputs and excellent physics engine based on Unreal Engine. Sumo is expert for modifying the map, while for Carla, it would be quite hard. In contrast, in Carla, we can easily change the weather, the day or night, so they both get their advantage in some aspect. And then we would like to talk about technical details about how we can put the scenes into simulate. The first and the most important work is to translate the map data from the new scenes format to open drive. And here are two ways to do this task. In the red figure, I indicate them in green lines and red lines. The first way, the green lines, is to find the absolute position and the coordinate translation from the open street map to new scenes data. And then we can export the open drive format data from geographic information library However, we had tested this method and the, the result is not as good as we expected due to some reason. So we also working in another more challenging way, which is to directly generate open drive format data from new scenes. And this way works much data better. Here I will talk about both of these. Uh, then we would like to know the difference between new scenes map format and open drive. In new scenes dataset, there are many semantic and hierarchical map annotations, such as road segment, road, uh, road, uh, road itself, lanes, lane divider, walkway, parking lot, etc., which greatly helps us about map generation. However, on the bottom uh, implementation, all these annotations is described as polygons, which is quite hard for us to translate. Well, in new scenes data format, the road and the lanes is described as a bunch of geometric elements, such as the lines, the arcs, the Euler spirals, etc. So this translator is the most difficult part for us to do. And the first step of this part is to find the scene border. For example, for a specific scene in new scenes, it's a 20 second video. And uh, in this step, we would like to find the location, the area of the scene, so that we can click the map. Here in this figure, we found the first the 30 scenes location and the bounding boxes. All new scenes data comes from four locations, from Boston and Singapore. Here, we would like to illustrate the map from Boston. You can see that there are a great amount of scenes recorded in a small area of the map 
with this border and the bonding boxes, uh, we can get a small piece of map and avoid, avoid processing a large part of the map for every scene, which greatly reduces the time and memory. At the beginning of this step, we find out the corresponding part of the city using Google Map. In New Scenes dataset, they were collecting data from four places in two cities, which comes from America, Boston, and Singapore, of course. And then we export the corresponding area using OpenStreetMap and transform the exported data into Open Drive format using some third party tools. I put the link here on the bottom. Then we go to maps, one from the open street map and the other from new scenes. Here, we illustrate both of them here. And the next step is to find the coordinate translation between these two maps. The next step is to find the translation between the two maps. More generally, in this step, we need to find the coordinate translation from the new scenes map to world coordinate. To this end, and the process multi maps, we created a tool to do this task. In this tool, we manually select the corresponding points on both maps and use ICP algorithm to minimum the pairwise error. And then we reproject the coordinate translation to the original map. Here it represents in blue points. As the zoomed in figure illustrates, the red and the blue points match perfectly. So in this way, we can find the world coordinate for new scenes map. The next task for, of this translation is to find the relationship between lanes, the roads, the junctions, etc. In new scenes, they are only polygon geometric representation, so we would like to find out the topological relationships. For example, we want to know the successor or predecessor of a road, and for a junction, which the road and the lane is connecting to this junction. And uh, if they are in inbound connection or outbound connection, this information is quite important and fundamental for the open drive, but it is missing in new scenes. So we generate this information using our own methods. The difficulty is to process a great amount of corner cases. And after that, for each junction, we would like to know if one lane is legal to connect with the other. This task is very challenging. For this junction, there are 12 inbound lanes and 12 outbound lanes. So there will be nearly 80 possible movements to do. For the real world situation, the, the situation may be even more complicated like the red figure illustrates. And also the connection topology depends on local traffic rules. Here, we manually define some of the traffic rules for each junction. For example, left hand or right hand driving is a problem. For Singapore map and also Japan, the traffic rules is right hand driving. However, in America, especially the Boston map, it is left hand driving. Also, we can define if we want a U turn, a lane changing injunction, turn right only on utmost lanes and ignore traffic lights, etc. However, such definition may not agree with the real situation, which will be much more complicated. Sometimes, even human driver has to got a mistake in certain situations like this. So it, if possible, later we would like to borrow these rules from OpenStreetMap. Then another step is to generate a so-called virtual roads, which is not a kind of real road, but some kinds of virtual road to connect the lanes on both sides of junctions. For the road injunction, the inbound and outbound direction could be various such as drive directly in junction, the trajectory will be uh, like a line, and it could also be the Y-shape, T-shape, or turning, and even U-shape here. So hereby, we stage this problem as the follows here. Given two vectors, the inbound one and the outbound one, we want to find a combination of the geometry components, for example, the com uh, a combination of the line, the arc, the euro spiral, 
uh, to smoothly connect them to vectors, finding the order of geometric components, and then we calculate the parameter of these uh, of these components. In this part, the challenge is to process many corner cases because while we uh, while they build the road and the junction, the engineer got very weird imagination and the shape and the connection relationship could be complicated. Also, sometimes the lane center and the two borders on the left and the right, they are not parallel. For example, if the virtual lane is to right turn 90 degrees, the red border will just vanish. You know? So for the different lanes, and the left and the right border in the same lanes, the generation model could be varied. Here are the example of the junction connection topology and the shape of virtual road on junction. The purple arrow indicates the direction of the virtual road, while the red and the blue dash indicates the actual size of the virtual road. Here we can see the result is just like what we want. And here are some results of our generated road. On the top, there are original scenes from new scenes dataset. And on the bottom is the generated map in open drive format. Here we can see it's already a simulator status and uh, uh, can be directly put into simulator like Sumo and the card. And the next step of our research is to spawn the actor such as the vehicle, the pedestrian, and the cyclist on uh, the map and generate their behavior. The goal of this part is much easier. Mm -hmm. Firstly, we want to reproduce the new scene's original scene on the top. Then we uh, may try to remove or change the status of object here. For example, the pedestrian, the vehicle, the barrier, and the obstacle here. Or we can randomly spawn the object on the map to derive the scene. For the object ma manager, we are trying to give the initial velocity, the initial state, the initial behavior of the agent, and try to give the so-called desired trajectory in this scene. Also, sometimes we want to manually change or edit the scene. For example, when we are simulating this scene, we will think about what will happen if this vehicle just turn the left, not the right here, or what if we remove this vehicle in the situation? So here I made a scene editor. For each scene in the new scenes dataset, we can manually edit the object distribution and the object's desired velocity and the trajectory here. And currently, this was Hello. Sorry. Basically, now there are two mainstream of NPC spawning system. A widely used one is a rule based system, which means we firstly find some expert and define a set of rules for them. And then we generate NPC just by these rules. Sorry. Many open source simulators, for example, the Carla and the Sumo, implement object spawning process in this way. And then because the, the recent rapid improvement of recurrent neural network, the data-driven process is in our scope. In this process, the model learns the object distribution from the real scenes, and then we generate the object by the, this distribution. Here I list some of the state-of-the-art research in these years. And this is quite a hot area to go uh, right now. Here, our current 
object generation system is a rule-based system. And here are some of the rules we follow on this process. It's a only very simple model with the basic rules. And currently this methods work fine, but there are still many things to be introduced here. And uh, maybe in next stage, we would like to change it to data driven model. Here are the results of the object generator algorithm works on different maps uh, uh, from the new scenes. From here, we can see the vehicle is randomly placed on the lane and the pedestrians on set box. And here, all pedestrians and the vehicles are moving according to the given trajectory, and the one thing should be noticed is this trajectory here is only a desired trajectory and only indicates that the vehicle shall pass in this waypoint and then go to the destination. This desired trajectory shall be further inputted into simulator, and the simulator may have different ideas. For example, here, the desired, the desired trajectory for a vehicle is maybe you go straight and then turn right uh, on the junction. However, the simulator will say that, hey, this is not possible according to the traffic light and you shall wait here for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. For the desired trajectory generation, first we got the position and the belonging lane of a vehicle. Then for this lane, one by one, you can find its successor and for each junction successor, we get options like turn right, turn left, go straight, etc. And the vehicle will just randomly pick the behavior. So for example, the desired trajectory description of this circled vehicle will be like forward, 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 turn right, forward. And once the behavior is determined, the simulator will take charge of the actual trajectory generation, considering of intersection, traffic light, barrier, etc. Here, we got a more detailed aspect of the desired rule. For each junction, there are a set of possible directions to go according to the junction connection topology. And for each vehicle passing by this junction, it randomly picked one of the direction to go. Here are some of the video clips of the simulated scenes in new scenes. Anyway, in this step, we have been successful, successfully simulate the scenes in new scenes data set. And the next step, we will try to produce a more bet a better simulation result here. Then for the quality of map generation, we would like to introduce our next work about the auto map quality evaluation. The motivation of this task is quite simple. There are 1,000 scenes in new scenes, so that we must think about a, a way to auto evaluate some aspect of generation. If we manually check all generation results, human evaluation of the map generation will be hard and uh, will easily ignore very small problems, uh, such as the direction of the lanes or the connection topology in a junction. And then when we fix an error, we may also introduce 100 of them, and it may also influence the previous correct results. So uh, when we fix an error, we shall re-evaluate uh, all of the scenes and the, the uh, time and the human cost is huge. So automatically map evaluation is very necessary here. Here we got four aspects for, of the map generation quality evaluation. For the connectivity level, we don't want topology isolated load components here. By checking out the connectivity, we can find out the separate parts of the lane or the road, which may indicate an error. For example, if the road network got two or more connection components, which means the vehicle can not from the one components to the other, that would possibly be wrong. Then the geometry consistency is necessary. 
Also, we can do similar things on geometric consistency and find the IPC behavior if it is abnormal in simulation. Here, he illustrates the example of the uh, real to generation consistency and the geometry consistency here. Like here, I illustrate from the new things data set, we can get a real world position of pedestrians and vehicles. Then we place them on generated map and find if it is a legal position or not. Here we assume they all obey the traffic rules. Like this example, if there are a vehicle driving on the lane and in the generated map, it falls out of the lane, we can make, can make sure that the generate process is failed here. Then the IOU of the lane polygon and the, the generated lanes is quite important. If the polygon deviates a lot from the generated lane border, we can be quite sure that there must be something wrong. Here. Finally, on the technical detail, we would like to share about our ideas about scenario-based evaluation for self -driving. Automated evaluation of self-driving system is of utmost importance. Previously, in most the situation, such evaluation is made in simulator and we don't want to crash the accident vehicle, right? However, if we test them in simulated area, how do we know that the generated scene is agree with the real world scene? So in the first contribution of our work, uh, is that we can simulate the traffic risk and the accident in real world maps. In other words, the map is real, but the accident could be manually configured, like the red figures illustrates here. Then for our research, we make a bridge between the real world scene data set to a simulator and find out if we can slightly change the scene and uh, see what will happen. Like these two figures illustrated, the original scene is on the right, and uh, then we just put a, a lucky guy here in the circle and let him crossing the road, ignoring every situation. And then we can put the modified scene into the self-driving system or uh, to the simulator and see what will happen then. That would be interesting. From a more theoretical view, for each scene, we may put them into a parameter space. In most of the time, the self-driving system works well. However, in very rare situation, the self-driving system may fail because such failure is quite rare and it would be hard for our system to learn from this failure. So if we can slightly modify the scene, we could generate many similar scenes from this failure. That would be many beneficial for the researchers to analyze the result of failure and also for the model training. And these generated scenes could not be constrained into the same map, but also different maps with similar situation. Later, I will talk about that. Finally, I will talk about the future plan of this task. The first task is to utilize the open scenario standard as the scene description. Previously, they are using JSON configuration, the open drive file, and sometimes the ROS bag to describe the scene as the map. Here are some development details for us to do. After finishing the map translation task, in next stage, we will be focusing on better simulation in Sumo and Carla, and bring additional detail for the generated scenes. Finally, for the future plan, please allow me to first introduce our previous work about the road scene ground, which is the work we keep doing last year. In next months, we would like to combine the road scene graph with this real to synthetic work. In this work, we annotated a small data set called RSG. This data set contains some kinds of the road relationships such as human right waiting for a vehicle or the vehicle approaching another vehicle, et cetera. Uh, here, the tables on the bottom lists those thematic relationships. 
And then we develop the uh, graph neural network based model to predict these relationships. The result of such prediction model illustrates on the right figures. On the right, we proposed a result about the predicted the roads in graph here. With the real to synthetic task, we can automatically generate the relationships between the objects and the uh, uh, map assets. For example, the case nearby the lane, the vehicle turn left on the, in the junction, the vehicle changing the lane, etc. These relationships will be also very important for the model training and the model evaluation. As the figure on the right uh, here illustrates, the green relationships on top left and the orange one from the on the top bottom left is just the, the new information we would like to draw in into our load scene graph design. And the blue one here is for the relationships we already have. Here we can see the category of relationships between object and the map assets is far more than the relationship from one object to the un another, which will greatly help us for the training for and for evaluating. For example, if a graph got more relationships, the amount of the individual connect components will be smaller and the connectivity of this graph. And in a future uh, further plan, we would like to build a bridge between the natural language description and the make uh, the translation from the natural language description to the road scene graph here. For example, consider a simple scene retrieval problem. If we would like to create our scenes in the data set and find out which one includes a vehicle voiding two pedestrians, we got a language query and we can put it into a small scene graph for the graph. And then we can apply the graph matching problem here to do this scene retrieval task. And that means we shall work on four modules, which are the natural language to traffic scene, traffic scene to natural language, load scene graph to traffic scene, and the traffic scene to graph. Here, the scene generator is just like an unlimited data generator to produce the scenes for training. Okay, that's all about my work about real to synthetic. Thank you very much for your listening. And uh, any comments, the ideas are welcome. Thank you. Okay, that's all about my talk today. And uh, uh, any comments, questions are uh, welcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have any questions or comments? Uh, yes, a, a hello, a comment. Hey, hello. Hey, uh, regarding the um, uh, map connectivity and the map quality evaluation, uh, um, say, how do you, for example, get, consider the cases where uh, there's uh, some a, in some overlap, partial overlapping between these polygons. Uh, partly overlapping. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, like for example, you you show that there are some gaps. Uh, but yeah. what happens if the the polygons are overlapping? Uh, it shouldn't be that uh, actually the polygons should be aligned uh, like edge to edge. But um, what happens if they are not? Yeah, I just use uh you know some uh, called union to merge the polygons. For example, I've got a polygon for the road and uh, another polygon for the junction. Of course, sometimes they will have a little bit uh, overlapping, 
So we made a union and the cut them together to see mm -hmm. what part is the road and what part is the poly, uh, which is uh, which part is the you know junction. Uh, we just <laughs> use this way, very simple. Okay, so th that means that uh, when you um, um, you know make that conversion from a new scenes to uh, open drive and all, all this uh, configuration that you have now, especially with the intersections. Um, you after uh, applying those conversions and uh, modifications, then you run your uh, quality assessment, uh, automatic quality assessment uh, software. Uh, if the quality is uh, not enough, uh, then you then recheck again on the map to see what is missing or something like that. Uh, yeah, maybe if we. Uh, if uh, you know if the generation uh got some of the problems, we will check if this uh if this problem comes from our own or sometimes the problem for the polygons or the uh, for and uh, for the new scenes data set. You know, currently there are uh, you know a blacklist in the SDK of new scenes and uh, because you know sometimes they got some internal error. For example, polygons are not aligned or something else. That, that's fine. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Tian, uh, for your uh, uh, nice presentation. Uh, we really enjoyed that. Um, okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for, for listening uh, patiently and uh, being with us all uh, the, uh, uh, the workshop. Um, uh, at the end, uh, I, I would like to uh, thank my uh, colleagues uh, from the University, my, our sponsors uh, from uh, Nagoya University and uh, from uh, Jari, and also uh, from the IEEE ITSS Nagoya chapter. Uh, from uh, the uh, Augsburg University of Applied Science. Also, I, I like to thank uh, Armen, uh, Matthias, uh, and uh, if uh, Professor uh, Karsten can, can like give us a closing remarks, uh, that would be uh, great. Uh, then we can uh, wrap up our, uh, uh, our workshop. If, if it, if it's okay, if it's not, we, we can wrap up right away. Um, Martin, hi. Um, okay. Lots of remarks from me and Armin as well, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. For, yeah. Okay. And okay. If, if Professor Karsten also available, uh, we would like to hear from him. Uh, I don't know if he's available right now, but um, I can start. Yeah and sure. then hand over to Armin. Uh, first of all, it was a great workshop. Learned um, a lot of new stuff, especially for me, it was interesting to hear about uh, the developments um, in Kala, because I'm using um, a closed source environment, which makes it quite interesting to see the Kala environment. And yeah, the other talks were also very exciting. Um, yeah, looking forward to, to use Kala in the future, hopefully, hopefully I can have the time to use this one as well. And thanks for the organization again. And I'll hand over to Armin. Yeah, thanks a lot for joining. And uh, I hope uh, we see all of you uh, in the open source community contributing to Open Planner and the uh, tools we did uh, show to you today. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
also uh, I would like to uh, invite everyone here. Uh, we have a meeting every two weeks. You can join us and uh, contribute to our work. And if you have additional questions, also you can come and ask us. Uh, it's the AutoWare Open Planner Working Group. We have uh, Slack. Uh, we're part of uh, the AutoWare Slack uh, channels. Um, so uh, please join us. Uh, and uh, at the end, I would like to uh, again thank everyone working on this workshop, uh, Professor Takeda and uh, uh, Professor uh, Carson. Uh, and also, I'd like to th thank uh, uh, Alexander uh, Carvalho. Uh, he also supported uh, me and uh, helped me in uh, organizing the, uh, uh, the st first stages of this uh, workshop. Uh, and uh, again, I thank our uh, sponsors. And uh, this, is, uh, this is it. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, looking forward, uh, check our website for the upload the videos and the materials and maybe in a couple of weeks. Thanks again and goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Hey, thank you and goodbye. Goodbye, thank you. Excellent work.